I know everybody. I heard that. I see the chat. People are saying, Tim, you promised us a civil war, not World War Three. What's going on with this Nancy Pelosi in Taiwan stuff? So the trip is confirmed. We've got U.S. officials and Taiwanese officials confirming Nancy Pelosi, at least is expected to be visiting Taiwan. China has been posturing rather intensely, putting out a video showing their military capabilities. And we even had a Chinese state propagandist saying outright they would shoot down or could shoot down Pelosi's plane, particularly if she had a a fighter jet escort. So we'll see how much of that is bluster. Many people are wondering why she's even doing this. What's the purpose? Well, we'll talk all about that. We've got a couple other stories, too, that are, are rather interesting. Of course, we've got just chaos as it pertains to the economy, and I'm sure that'll come up. But we've got a discussion about the Convention of States. A new article co- has come out sa- uh, showing conservatives are 15 states away from calling a Convention of States. So I know when you say, where's the Civil War, Tim? I, I know the big news is Pelosi, but the Convention of States thing is, is here. You know, maybe they'll lose their minds over that. And then at the same time, I think what's also equally interesting as well, the corporate press is freaking out that conservatives might actually get a convention of states. The Democrats are actually rather close to the national popular vote interstate compact coming into play, which would effectively create a popular vote for the presidency. So uh, should be interesting nonetheless. Before we get started, my friends, head over to TimCast.com. Become a member if you'd like to support our work and you'll get access to the exclusive members only show tonight at 11 p.m. That's usually when they go up. We record them a little bit, a little bit earlier, and this is the uncensored after-hours show. But we also have a couple other shows up on the website. Tales from the Inverted World, episode five has, has come out, and Shane says it is the best one yet. So if you're a fan and you like the exploration into the lost Confederate gold, sign up at TimCast.com. Don't forget to smash that like button. Subscribe to this channel. Share the show if you really do like it. Joining us today to talk about all of this and more is Senator Rick Santorum. Hello, how are you? Would you like to introduce yourself? I'd be happy to. Uh... I'm Rick Santorum. I'm a uh, most important thing in my life is I'm a father of uh, seven kids and I have one grandchild and two on the way, which is really exciting for me. Um, I am a former United States senator, served uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for 12 years, four years in the House before that and ran for president twice. Um, I always say you should run for president. Seriously, I mean, it's you're, it's, saying, you're saying I yeah, should or yeah, they should. Yeah, you should run for president. <laughs> Don't look yeah. at me. No, I mean, you should run for it's it it's it's one of the great experiences. I mean, anybody that's really it's ever run for president, uh, it it's a tremendous experience of learning this country and understanding how the political process works. And for me, as as someone who came out of it, who went in there and basically had no money and was not given any chance, and ended up winning eleven states and almost winning the nomination, uh, it 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 should if if you put your put your best into it should renew your faith in American uh, politics. But even as far as you got, not everybody could get anywhere near that. You don't know. Yeah. You don't know. I mean, look, I mean, you got a guy, who's the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana almost became, yeah. you know, and now is the number <laughs> one person for president. Look, you have, you have no idea how America, it, no one would have predicted Donald Trump doing what he did. Exactly. And, and, and so don't, People say, "Oh, it's only for the privileged and only for the." It's just not. It, you have, you have all sorts of opportunities, and you can have a billionaire like Michael Bloomberg can get nowhere, and you can have someone who didn't even who didn't even spend a million dollars on his campaign and won the Iowa caucuses. Like a lot me, of that, so it can happen. A lot of that Bloomberg money went to me actually, oh, good. because he was buying YouTube ads, and so all of a sudden, everyone on YouTube who's talking politics was seeing these Bloomberg ads pop and they, they pop up, and they're getting paid for it. So well, well, I, 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 do, I definitely want to talk to you about your time, you know, in the Senate and all that stuff, too. So thanks for thanks for joining us. Sure. We also have Mark Meckler. Good to be with you. Uh, so my background is legal. I was a lawyer for most of my professional career, uh, ended up stumbling into politics during the days of the Tea Party, founded the largest Tea Party organization in the nation. Ultimately, 23 million people sort of changed the political landscape. And then I bailed on it because it became part of Washington, D.C. I watched it get co-opted. You have the biggest swing election in the history of America since 1938 takes place in 2010. Literally by 2012, most of the folks that were elected had been eaten by the swamp. I was getting ready to leave and I had a friend who said, you can't quit politics. I said, yes, I can. I can go back to my chickens. I'm a chicken guy too. Yeah, chickens so, are great. so we're living out in the country. And he said, look, we can't give up. Uh, the, the problem in politics really isn't the people that we're electing or not electing. The problem is we broke the structure of government. And if you wanna repair the structure, there's a constitutional method for doing so found in article five. That's what we're doing. Trying to call a convention of states to propose amendments, to take power away from DC and give it back to the people. That's what I spend my time doing now. I've been in 48 states in the last couple of years. 
I'm just on the ground with grassroots all over the country, like uh, Senator Santorum. I love the American people. I have faith in the people, just not in the government anymore. I dig it. I like the idea. There's there's some pros and there's cons to but we'll get into all that stuff. Yep. We're also hanging out with Hannah Claire. Hi, I'm a writer for TimCast.com. My name's Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm filling in for Ian, who is away. I have no facts about gems for you. I wish I did. Yeah, or graphene. Yeah, I Tim had to explain to me what graphene was. I really feel like somewhere along the line, the American science uh, education has let me down. You have a bottle of graphene sitting right there, though, so it's yes. very impressive. <laughs> a patent-pending product is <laughs> sitting next to me. It makes me nervous. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to catch on fire. And Lydia's on vacation. So joining us, handling all of the camera work, is Chris. Yep. There you go. All right, let's jump into this first story. We got this from Politico. Pelosi, Taiwan trip overrides Chinese military threats. Military and diplomatic efforts limit Beijing to angry bluster. I mean, simply put, we only need the first opening paragraph here. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi will visit Taiwan on Tuesday, decisively ending weeks of wrangling between the United States and China about whether she should make the trip. Pelosi's controversial stop in Taipei, which would make her the highest ranking U.S. official to visit the self-governing island in decades, indicates that the Pentagon has downgraded its assessment of a potential credible Chinese military threat to the speaker's safety. Beijing has strongly protested Pelosi's Taiwan visit and issued lurid warnings of a stern Chinese response. Quote, a visit to Taiwan by her would constitute a gross interference in China's internal affairs and lead to a very serious situation and grave consequences. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian said Monday, I don't, I, I'm assuming you guys saw as well, you had that guy from Global Times basically say, we'll shoot her plane down. So I'm wondering, I got a couple questions. Why do you think she's going? Is the threat really, is there really a threat or is the World War Three stuff just people posting it because it gets clicks? Well, once she announced she was going, she had to go because when China reacted the way they did, uh, the speaker, the third ranking person in our government, the speaker in the United States can't can't be bullied to going to a uh, an allied country uh, because of China. Uh, China is the is the big threat to our to our country. It will be for uh for my lifetime and probably a lifetime of everybody listening to this uh, podcast, uh, China is a serious player. Uh, we don't take them as seriously as we should. I, and and uh, and I'm very happy to. I'm very. I, I don't agree with Nancy Pelosi on anything, but I I agree that she should go to Taiwan. I'm glad she's going to Taiwan. Why? I don't know why she's going, but I'm glad she is, and I'm I'm glad she stood up to the Chinese and is going tomorrow. Yeah, what do you think, Mark? Yeah, you know, I get a lot of fundraising texts from politicians on both sides of the aisle. Uh, it's a great fundraising ploy for Nancy Pelosi. I mean, really, you're going to see texts about this, about how she's saving the free world. And so I think part of it is a political play, and she's trying to set herself aside from the Biden administration. They're going to get their backsides handed to them in this election. And I think she wants to be able to blame Biden and separate herself from that. Really? I'm, is she, she's running for re-election. She's going to keep going. How old is she? She's 80? 83. Man, she's, she's already 83? been, she's been embalmed already. Uh, so yeah. she can go for a long time. She's older than I thought she was. I thought she was just shy of 80. She's 83. I think I could be wrong. Yeah, I think that's I think, correct. I think that's right. Yeah. Wow. I mean, crazy old. I think this is a problem we have in our government in general that people just serve literally until they pass away. And it's never the way it was intended to be. I think this is one of the fundamental problems in our country. I'm worried about military conflict, especially with China. And I wonder why it is because, you know, Rick, you mentioned China's the big threat, I think. I agree. Absolutely. Why is it Russia 24-7 on corporate press, mainstream media, Democrats, even a bunch of Republicans just scream Russia all day? Well, because Russia attacked Ukraine. I mean, no one was screaming Russia. I mean, uh, up the, until, I up mean until then. Trump and Russia and the Russian collusion. Well, everyone was and, screaming Russia because of Russian collusion, but they weren't they weren't concerned about Russia as a great threat to to the country. The, China is the great threat. And and candidly, we made China the great threat. We we had a policy, which, by the way, I, I was supportive of and 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 thought at the time it was a viable policy, which was to try to engage China, try to bring China into the 20, 21st century and uh, and you know build up capitalism within China and markets and and that that would uh, move China toward uh, a, a more peaceful and free world. Uh, all we've done is uh, arm arm them with uh, many more resources than they would have ever had if they stuck in their uh, old pre-market days and uh, made them a real threat. Uh, we have to we have to start acting differently. That's a whole other discussion. But we're not doing enough to confront China right now. Do you regret your position yeah. in China? Well, do I regret it? It's was it a 
was it a good idea? Was it a viable option? It hadn't been tried before. And, and you can say, well, we tried it. It didn't work. Was, I, hate, I hate going back and said, well, you know, I, I, it was a bad idea. Well, no, it was actually an interesting idea. Could it have worked? Maybe with a different leader in China, maybe with different, th I don't know, but it didn't work. You know, I, and I, I think, think we just have to recognize it didn't work. There's a long-term misunderstanding of Americans of culture internationally. I think we're very ethnocentric with a Western cultural view. The idea that you were going to take a country with a 3,000 year history and change their view of themselves in the world. You know, they call themselves the one sun. There's only one sun in the galaxy and that's China. They've always believed that. And so I think it's just, and I think we do this, I'm not pointing at you in particular, but I think we do this as a nation that we look at other countries and we think, oh, they have the same aspirations as we do. You know, they wanna be part of the world community. It was never China's aspiration. I'm not saying I understood this back then. I'm saying in hindsight, and I think we need to look at the world more realistically. Where are they actually coming from? What's their history? What do they really want? Now, not what can we do? What will they do if we're nice to them, which tends to be our foreign policy? I, I, the, only, the only thing I would say is we have to look at it in the context of when this happened. This was basically the 19, late, late 80s and 90s, and the Soviet Union had fallen. The, 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 the Iron Curtain had fallen. And so we, we were feeling, feeling our oats that, yes. that in fact, we can affect the course of geopolitics. If you remember, we, books were written, the end of history, right? Well, you know, democracy and capitalism, that was gonna be it. And, and that was hubris, but if you look at what, how things had gone, during, thanks to Reagan and others who stood up against the Soviets and, and, and did infiltrate them with a lot of information about free speech and capitalism, you can make the argument it, it sort of worked. Now, what's happened since then has been a, a cluster, but it, is, it's a, it's, it was not an irrational thing to contemplate at the time. I think it's the inverse. I think... You had a lot of special interests in the United States that thought, you know, we could democratize China, we could, you know, bring capitalism there. Instead, what's, what's ended up happening is the weird authoritarian communist woke stuff has been seeping into our side of things. Our movies are being edited to placate yeah. China, not right. the other way around. Yeah, and I think, look, there's a, there's a military power, raw military power, what they do in South China Sea. The economic power and their understanding of economic leverage has been extraordinary. The amount of Chinese money that's flowed into this country it's not that hard to buy most people. I hate to say that, but when, when you go to somebody and it's here's a few million dollars and people have never been able to imagine that kind of money and all you have to do is be nice about China, censor some stuff about China, people do it. Do you know the stories about how the Chinese would manipulate POWs or, or you know, in war? No. What, the, what they would do is they would say something like, if you want to eat today, you need to tell us one thing that you think is wrong with, with America or, or something to that effect, like whatever country they were from. And they would say something like, uh, we've got a homelessness problem, right? Of course, America's not perfect, but it's one small step at a time. That's the psychological manipulation. And I feel like we're experiencing that on a grand scale. I don't know, you know, we've had, we've had guests here who are researchers on China who tell us that we know about, what do they call it, the 50 cent army? Are you, you guys familiar with that? No. That uh, citizens of China or people like, who, wor who work in propaganda get paid 50 cents every time they post something pro-China or disparaging about its enemies. So you go on social media and what happens? You go on Twitter, you go on YouTube, for instance, and you say bad things, they flag you, they mass flag you, they report you. You go on Twitter, all of a sudden you're being inundated, ratioed right. with people being like, you're, you're wrong and you don't understand. They have these people attempting to manipulate public opinion. I think, I think we had a lot of politicians who really, really underestimated the future of what warfare was going to be like. Yeah, we're, I mean, we, you, 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 you took the words out of my mouth. We were at war with China. And, and I know that people say, oh, yeah, warmonger and warmonger. No, no, I'm not saying that we are. In fact, the problem is we're not at war with China. We're not treating China the way they're treating us. The, the, the espionage that goes on here, the, the stealing of technology, I mean, it's just, it is incredible how much of, of American created ingenuity has been ex expropriated to China. And, and yet we allow thousands, maybe millions, I don't know, of Chinese to come here, to go and get educated here in our countries and, 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 and bring all that technology Buy back. land here? Yeah. It's, oh, man. It's, it's, it's we, we have to sort of take a step back and say, 
Why are we letting people come into this country who are here to steal technology, to be educated, to come turn around and then use it against us? So again, we aren't on a war footing when it comes to China. We would never during uh, any pick another period of history when when someone was attacking us, we would never allow them to come and and have positions of, of power and authority and education and and use it to hurt us. And we do with China. And you're and I think, again, you hit the point. A lot of it is money. I mean, the fact is these universities need these students and want these students because they pay cash. It's also true of private independent boarding schools. If you look at the ratio of international students, when a school is about to go under, they start really opening the doors to international, specifically usually it's China and Korea, because their families have the money to pay tuition. They don't have to offer scholarships. I feel like in my lifetime, we've always had sort of been on our back foot with China. And I increasingly, I agree, it's definitely the economic uh, chokehold that they have on us. I mean, when the White House announced they were going to boycott the Olympics this year, it was like, well, we're going to diplomatically boycott. The, what's going on with the Uyghurs is really yeah, bad. So we're not going to send <clears throat> Biden, but also athletes, don't take your phones because they will be hacking them. It's just routine. Like we took this very strange, like just boycott, just don't go, don't send anyone. And that is definitely a tragedy for a lot of athletes who've worked really hard for that. But we just always placate China. We don't take this cohesive stance we always sort of say well we're we're sort of we're sort of against that well we don't know and i think it's just it's so strange it is the worst part of american foreign, foreign policy for me because we're economically dependent upon them mm -hmm. That's so just the reality I, let's, I, I just got to say it i mean this is uh, a lot of what we're talking about is indicative of, of some kind of western or, or u.s cultural or governmental collapse absolutely that's why i think a convention of states uh, we've already got people who are chatting saying like they, they think it's a bad idea for a variety of reasons, which we'll definitely get into in a bit. But I, what I want to say is when you take a look at what's going on with China, what do they have? They have a strong authoritarian structure, a, 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 a monoculture that is the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. People like to often point out like we're not talking about the Chinese people. We're talking about their government. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Look, I, I think I think colloquially it's understood. We're talking about their government the stranglehold the government hold the government has, the suppression of information they have. We don't have that in the United States. To a certain degree, we do, obviously. Big tech censorship, the corporate propaganda press will, will run lies. But this show exists, so we're clearly better than China. But that's also, as much, of it, as it, is, as much as it is a strength, it's, a, it's something they exploit. They know there are people in this country that they can pay who will say whatever needs to be said because we don't have a cohesive shared culture anymore. It used to be, we were, we were talking about this last week with uh, the fall of empires. I think Zuby was bringing this up, that when you no longer have the idea of like God in country, I don't mean that literally God in country, I mean like this idea of like, this is our country, this is what we believe, this is what we share, this is our experience. When you don't have that anymore, your country can, can be gutted, ripped apart, and that precipitates the collapse. So now I see what's happening with China. They're absolutely exploiting our political divisions. How much longer can we last? When you have the Thousand Talents program, China goes in and they pay professors to, to give up our research. Where you've got stories about Chinese nationals ferrying vi viruses and vials getting caught and arrested. They, there's, there's no respect for this country. And the problem is we don't have a unified culture. We have a culture war, which means they can keep just chipping away at the crack until the rock splits. Well, and that's the intent. The culture war is at least partially being fostered by the Chinese. It's part of the reason they censor our culture. I have a young friend who's on the UC Berkeley campus, I mean, one of the most liberal campuses in the country. She's half ethnic Chinese. Her mom was ethnic Chinese. She was raised in her family to hate America. She was raised to believe that this is a vile, terrible place, that Americans are not to be trusted, and that eventually China would prevail. And China specifically meaning the CCP. That's on a mainstream college campus. That culture, that idea is supported. She said the majority of the Chinese that she knew on campus believed this. You know, she's welcome to walk in those communities because of her partial ethnic Chinese background. And she said it's just horrendous. It's totally anti-American. And it is at the forefront of culture on our college campuses all across the country. How long, how, how long can something like this go on for, especially... You know, when I look at Pelosi going to Taiwan, my question is, you know, for what purpose does it serve? Like you were saying just a moment ago, that's a lot of what people are asking. Is it a distraction? Is it the Democrats are failing so miserably that she's like, well, this will shake up the news cycle and get us, get, get us off the recession? Maybe the idea is like wartime presidents do well. Maybe if I go there and confront China on something, it'll be good for the Democratic Party. 
Yeah, to me, it seems like a distraction. I mean, it's a it's an excellent political distraction. They've got no good news that the Democratic Party can run on. Right. The economy is a shamble. Our industries are falling apart. Our standing in the international community is at an all time low. Their own base despises them basically at this point. If you look at the numbers among Hispanics, we've never seen anything like this in in the modern history of the country. 24% approval rating for Biden among Hispanics, lower than among whites. I mean, it's really extraordinary. So she needs to do something. She needs to roll some kind of political hand grenade in the room to try to distract. Yeah, I have taken the approach uh, throughout my time in politics when someone does something that I think is good for the country even though they may be doing it for the wrong reason, I commend them for doing it. And, and so I'm not going to say anything negative about Nancy Pelosi going there because I think it's 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 the right thing to do. The, I fact agree. That, the fact that the Biden administration did not want her to go and it was very clear they didn't want her to go because they were afraid of China's reaction. And she stood up to them and said and obviously said she was going uh, again. There may be there may be politics behind there. May, like everybody What's does everything for a reason. She did that. I have I don't know. I have no idea. It makes no sense to me <laughs> why she's doing it other than she under, maybe she understands. I, I don't, I can't understand how people don't understand how big a threat China is and how important this conflict is. And look, we tend to think of everybody on the other side. is just horrible, terrible on everything. And they don't care about America anyway. I, I look, I serve with these people and, and I think, 90% of the time, that's true. But there are people that uh, that do care about the security of our country and understand that China is a threat on the other side of the aisle. Maybe she's one of them. Again, I may be giving her more credit than she deserves, but I'm willing to give her the benefit of the doubt because she's doing the right thing. I, I, I respect her going to Taiwan, um, but I question it, obviously. And it, it it's like, I really don't like her as as a person, everything she represents, the elitism of, of politics. I think she's a bad person. I think she's manipulative. I think she's overly emotional. I think she and 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 her cohorts traded untold, untold problems for the United States during the Trump years with the obsession over Russia and the lies they espoused. And I think it's 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 all that's true. Say, right. And all I'll that's like, true. But I do you know, respect to going to Taiwan, I guess. But I look I know her. I served with her. I spent I spent time I mean, I know Nancy. I, I mean we're not buddies, but uh and so this is a, a real head scratcher for me. Uh, but yeah, give her. You her know, due. look, thinking about the current state of the culture war, and you know, I'm thinking about we've got the, the you know the first time of the show we're like World War Three, China, what's happening? And now it's like uh, civil war. Are, are we heading in that direction? Can people trust the politicians? We've got people in the chat who are saying you're a rhino. Right, but you're that's me. That Republican in name only. <laughs> that's me. Um, obviously, nobody. <laughs> and I, and I bet you they've been involved in politics and have, have worked on conservative causes for forty years, just like I have. I bet I'm a rhino, right? Oh yeah. yeah. This, I mean, this is the problem I have. You, I have so many people come up to me who have been a conservative for twenty minutes, and and they say, "Oh, this guy's a rhino." Yeah, this guy's a rhino. Who, if you if you Google my name, you see what kind of rhino I am. That I've been I've been ostracized for the last twenty years for standing up for for cultural truths and for standing up for uh, a you know free markets. And look, I, I I I respect everybody can have their opinion on things. And one of the things that I I realized is you just go do the right thing and don't worry about what other people say about right. you. And and so I'm I'm out here right now where I'm. I'm Teaming up with another guy who's called a rhino on occasion, right? Yep. Uh, oh yeah. Because uh, among other things, among other things, for uh, for standing up for the the ultimate in our constitutional freedoms, which is federalism, uh, the idea that America will end up candidly in a civil war if we don't begin to respect that people in some areas of the states are going to live their lives differently than people in other areas of the states. And by yeah. the way. That was the case from the very beginning. That's what our founders understood could hold a country together as big and diverse. Even at that point, we were talking about 13 colonies, but they saw the vastness of the United of, of what could be the United States. And they realized over a country of this size, you're going to have people who are going to behave and want different lifestyles. People who are going to live in the mountains are not going to be the same as people are going to live right. in the cities. And, and the idea that that we're going to have a central government that's powerful, that's going to make everybody have the same ideas and philosophies and not give local control and freedom to uh, to states and communities and families to live their lives the way they want. Th- they realized that that was a loser. And and so federalism was the approach. And that's what we're trying to restore through this process. Rhode Island. 
Rogue Island. Yeah. It's basically a city <clears throat> yeah. that has two senators. That should have lost a seat in Congress during the last census, but they messed up. Oh, their wow. Data. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I just think it's funny when the, the Democrats come out and they're like, why, do, why does Wyoming get you know, two senators? I'm like, why does Rhode Island? It's like, I, I understand there's Delaware. a million people there. Delaware, exactly. Yeah, right. Delaware and is, is uh, only a tiny bit bigger. You know, so I, I got to tell you, man, I don't envy you, know, uh, you being in politics. People are always mentioning, like, will you ever consider politics? And I'm like, no, never. There's no way to represent everybody. And that's exactly what the well, founding you know, fathers uh, Look, I, I, th- I, don't, I think that it's a, it's a ridiculous idea that you're going to represent everybody. I mean, you you got to be you have to be mentally ill to be to be able to yeah. represent everybody there's such diversity in this country i i've always people have always said you know how did you do it how did you how did you uh you know go to washington and because i always felt like my duty was to do what uh, gather as much information as i could look at the context of which everything was done and make the best decision and then make your case as to why you know why 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 it's right for america and not worry about the electoral consequence because you can't you can't just go out and, and, and jump from whatever the poll says from one time to another. Look, there's 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 truth. I believe in it. I believe there is a truth. And I believe that, that uh, our founders put together a process that uh, in our constitution that works and you just follow those those two things, the truth and the and and, and aligning with the constitution, you'll be fine. Yeah. You know, I, I look at we we often will talk about here. Who's right in the culture war, the left or the right? What does left and right even mean? Right? I, I grew up liberal and here I am being called right wing because one simple reason, I know what's going on in the media. So a really great example, or I, was going, I know what's going on in politics. A really good example is we had a guest on the show who claimed, I said, Joe Biden said, if you want the billion dollars, you got to fire the prosecutor. And he said, looked at me, smirked and said, that never happened. And then I pulled up the video and played it for him and he was shocked. This is what makes you right wing these days. That if you show a video in the news that people are talking about, they don't know. Why? Because CNN's lying, because MSNBC is lying, on occasion Fox News even. So when you've got, here's what I see. It's the rule for the Democrats that they are misleading you. It is the exception with Republicans that they're misleading you. There are a lot of bad Republicans. They're often misleading you. But there's a handful of, of really good ones. On the Democrat side, I... We had Tulsi Gabbard, I thought, was being honest. I didn't agree with some of her political positions. Look what happened to her. Now she's going on Fox News. Now she's... She's alt right now. I know. It's, it's <laughs> because when, when you talk about what's true, that clearly makes you right wing, even if your political positions. How do we salvage, I hate to say it, this country? How do, we, how do we save it? When you've got people who believe media lies, that, that the media can just make something up, Claim you're the one making it up. And, and the example I always give, these are the people who believe Jesse Smollett. These are the people who chased after the Russia Gate narrative for years and spent tens of millions of dollars. These are the people who smeared the Covenant Catholic kids. Uh, clearly, they got a track record, for, tra- track record of being wrong. But there are people who just never break out of those lies. H- how, do you, how, do you, how do you do it? Especially when we're talking about, for, for you, you know, or anyone else who's in office, you're showing up and you're like, okay, that's not true, Nancy. The thing you're saying about Trump didn't happen. Why do you believe that? And then she votes on something based on a fabrication. They vote because Justice Smollett said something. The only thing you can do is continue to fight and tell the truth. I mean, that's 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 all you have. And I would make the argument. I mean, look at this show as an example. I got involved in politics uh, a lifetime ago. Uh, I was first elected to Congress in 1990. I was 32 years old. And the only way I could ever get the truth out was to buy an ad. I, I it, the Talk radio didn't even exist. I mean, Rush Limbaugh was just getting started wow. back then. You, it, it, everything was whatever the newspaper or the television said. And there, wasn't, there weren't cable news networks even back then. So all you had was the national media and then your local media. And if you had a dissenting voice, you either had to run a campaign and buy ads or you had to knock on as many doors as you could. So the idea that that we are powerless to fight against these lies, you're a case in point where that simply isn't true. The reality is we have more opportunity to get our point across today than we've ever had. Now, they have more opportunities to get there because there's more media generally. The bigger problem we have is not that we can't get our message out. It's how do you talk to people that don't agree with you? That's the problem. The problem is you're, you're, we're siloed. Everybody just gets, you know, uh, 
information that agrees with their point of view and they and they discount to the point of not believing anything that comes from people that they don't re, they, they don't agree with it's true but it is the the rule on the left and the exception on the right there's a decent amount of people on the right who believe fake things and they just look for tribal uh, answers yeah but on the left it is the rule. it's a way of life yeah so <laughs> Yeah. For instance, because they don't believe in truth. I mean, so then I mean, let's just get to the bottom I line. Completely here. agree. They, I they, mean, they 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 believe in in a, they have power. a relative they have a relative relativism point of view. My that, truth. It's my truth, and and whatever they think <laughs> is the truth. And and conservatives, by and large, not all, because we have some I truth folks on our side too. But overall, I think you're right. It's the exception. Yep. We believe there is a truth, there is a right and wrong, there is reason, and but through reason you can come to a a a a, a conclusion. They don't believe that anymore. It's how I feel. Exactly. It comes. I, I, they, I always go ahead. I was going to say they they don't believe in truth. They believe there is no truth but power. Correct. That's it. Which actually the roots of it, even in our modern culture today, come from Marxism. I mean, that is the Literally core Marxism. ideal yeah. of Marxism. And ultimately, one of the things that Marxists do, and they've always done throughout history, is if you can control what people say, you can control what they think. If you can control what they think, you control reality, essentially, and you're in total control. Then this is the ultimate aim of totalitarianism. And ultimately, that is the aim of the modern Democratic Party. And, today. and that's why you see a complete effort to redefine everything, to oh, yeah. make words mean nothing. Didn't they redefine the word definition? <laughs> that may have been a meme. That may have been a meme. Uh, do you know what the people's mic is? What there's a reference to? No. no. During Occupy Wall Street, this probably predates Occupy, but this is when I, my first, I first encountered it. You're not allowed to use electronic voice amplification in New York. So what we're going to do is when I say something, everyone repeat it back at me so that everyone can hear. Then the speaker stands up and says, mic check. Everyone yells, mic check. And then they'll say something that the entire crowd repeats. Now, anybody who knows anything about cults knows that that's a cult, ind cult indoctrination Absolutely. technique. I remember their videos. Right. And the videos are, are insanely creepy. There's one where I post on an Instagram where everyone's sitting with their hands up and there's someone chanting like, you know, Black Lives Matter is good. And everyone just re repeats it after the speaker. It's like they've and, and this is with amplification. So we're, we're no longer in the space where we need to lie and claim. We're just trying to make people sound louder so you can hear what they had to say. Now they have the speakers and they're still doing the same thing because making you say something over and over again and drives it, drills it into your brain. I think we're dealing with a cult and their counter is projection. They say the right is projecting on us. And then it's like, bro, you, you believe Jesse Smollett. Spare me. OK, well, the Trump people are in the Q cult. And I'm like, that's like 10 people. OK, in, in all seriousness, there's maybe a few thousand, maybe tens of thousand. But we're talking about 74 million people who voted for Trump. They don't believe that stuff. These are people who work in, you know, union steel mills or whatever. They don't believe all that crazy nonsense. Some of them do. And those are the ones that Comedy Central puts on TV. But when you go to the left, these are the prominent million subscriber ch channels pumping out nonsense, misinformation and lies. Rachel Maddow nearly crying when the revelations that Trump didn't collude with Russia came out. I mean, did you see the video? Oh, yeah. I, and I do think that's the fundamental difference. You just nailed it, which is they'll pick the, the fringe on the right and try to make them mainstream. Mm -hmm. But the fringe on the left are the mainstream politicians, the mainstream media figures, the Hollywood figures. They're saying completely insane stuff that if anybody on the right ever said anything equivalent to that, if a Senator Santorum said something equivalent to that, I mean, it would be a 24 seven news meltdown. Yeah. The difference is that when our fringe people say fringe things, we condemn our fringe people mm -hmm. and we walk away from them. And I, yeah, like with their fringe people say fringe <laughs> things. Well, actually, they're mainstream people say fringe exactly. things. So, I was going to say, so, I've learned more about Q from NPR than I have from any right-wing person I've ever met in my life. I had no idea the details until I yeah. heard yeah. NPR give me an, a thorough explanation. I learned it from CNN, not NPR, but yes, yeah, same thing. Let's let's talk about the Convention of States. So, you know, we, we've been talking about first the potential for international conflict, but that leads us into internal conflict, people believing fake news. We've got a problem in the federal government. People aren't feeling like they're being represented. There is a lot of uh, people who wonder if a convention of states, it's a, what is it, Article 5 Convention of right, States to amend correct. the Constitution, I think? Yep, that's exactly right. Let me, let me pull up this story from Business Insider. Uh, this is Business Insider. 
Trump tied conservatives are 15 states away from an unprecedented rewrite. Is that you or me? I don't know. If, I don't know if Trump would call I me thought, a tied conservative. I thought I thought you guys were rhinos. I mean, <clears throat> yeah. I'm surprised yeah, to hear that you're now we're Trump. Based guys. Now guys. we're Trump conservatives. So there you go. So 15 states are, are, are away from an unprecedented constitutional convention. Now I bring up this article simply because they're shocked. They're worried. There may be constitutional amendments at the state level. I think it's fantastic. So what is this? Con you know, is, is, they're, they're freaked out. Obviously. They, think, they think it's a bad thing. We've had people already saying they're concerned that if you get uniparty establishment types to have the power of a convention of states, it's going to be gutting the Constitution. My view on that one, my, my, my counter before we, I'll throw it to you guys is the state level guys aren't the federal level establishment rhinos. People working at the state level are, are voted by uh, voted in by much smaller uh, amounts of people. So when it comes to a convention of states, you've got state reps, state legislators. So these are these are local guys. What, 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 why is it that you guys want this? What, what are your thoughts on it? Is it good or bad? Obviously, well, I think first case. of all, one of the most telling things about that Business Insider article, there's a, a statement of absolute horror that Congress couldn't control it. The president couldn't control it, and the courts couldn't control it. You mean the central government could and, not act? Oh my God! What are we gonna do? Horror, absolute horror, right? So I, I literally saw that article. It's a hit piece against us, and I thought this is fantastic. It's against you. It's a hit piece against you guys specifically. Yeah, against Convention Absolutely. of States. Yeah. A group with ties to Trump's orbit. That would be us. And corporate America <laughs> is leading the push. Corporate America. <laughs> Meanwhile, I, Trump is like, get out of here, you guys. Yeah. I don't even want you here. I, I love it. Corporate America. I do occasionally go to grocery stores yeah. owned by corporations. And I mean, Whoa. that's my tie you admit it. to my yeah. tie to corporate America. I drive a car that was produced by, that's about it, really. This is a grassroots group. There are over 5.2 million people involved, just regular folks all over the country. They're actually in every single state legislative district in the United States of America. And I understand why the establishment is terrified of this. And by the way, there's plenty of establishment on the right that is terrified of this too. They don't want us taking their power away and giving it back to the people. That's the entire purpose of this. The founders intended it for right now. This gets in the Constitution in 1787. Colonel George Mason from Virginia stands up two days before the end of convention. He says, this is terrible. We drafted a document, doesn't give the power to the people to propose amendments, but we gave that power to Congress. And he asks, are we so naive that we believe that a government that becomes a tyranny will restrain its own tyranny. Wow. Got to give the power to the people, right? And in fact, it's really weird. In Madison's notes, that's where we know everything that happened from the convention. All it says right there is NINCOM, Latin abbreviation for no comment. Not one guy in that room said, George, that's such a stupid idea. Everybody was a forehead slap. I think they probably laughed in that moment. So they put in this second clause of Article 5 saying, someday federal government's going to get out of control. We're going to count on you folks in the states to handle it. Are they gonna? Yeah. The, the, well, let me just a little further that the, 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 if you read anything about the founding, the, the founders were fixated on checks and balances. They wanted to, to have each branch of government check each other. They wanted to have the states to be a check. They were concerned about the aggregation of power into a central government or particularly because they came from places where there were kings and emperors they didn't want that power to all be in one place because they knew eventually tyranny would be taken over and the president or leader at the time would 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 do that and and so they put in uh, the united states senate as a check and the biggest check was that the united states senate was going to be appointed by the state legislatures yep and people forget that for the first 140 years of the republic Washington, D.C. was a backwater town with no power. <laughs> it was. Yeah, it wasn't important. Do you know what the largest source of revenue for the federal government was before the 17th Amendment, which, which changed the way senators were elected? Or like selling booze or something? Exactly. It was the tax on alcohol. <laughs> yeah. so the, reason, the reason we got the income tax is because of the temperance movement. Because the, the, the temperance movement could never pass in Washington. The, the prohibition couldn't pass in Washington because they couldn't give up the tax on alcohol. So they trade, the, the conservatives traded their vote for the income tax in exchange for prohibition. So we got the worst of both worlds, in my opinion. But anyway, they, <laughs> they, they also passed a, a constitutional amendment to change the way senators were elected to instead of having the states checking Washington from doing things to take the power away from them and the people, now it's the people that elected the Senate. So they took away the biggest check on power right. of Washington, D.C. And so this is the only other piece of the Constitution left. 
I, to check power from the states is Article 5 and a convention of states. I think it was Ben Sass who said maybe like a year ago that we should repeal the 17th. Oh, absolutely. Return, return I, the, sen- uh, the I, Senate to the... I, I, would, I would, before that, it has no chance of that. Yeah, I agree. Happen. I completely agree. People need to understand, there's a lot of people who look at single layer issues, the surface. The people choose the senators. It's way better. Oh, it sounds way better. And yeah. they say the, the, the idea that only the, the legislators would be able to appoint their friends. No, 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 listen. People have lost their connection with their local politics because there's no skin in the game anymore. Right. And it, it not only did the 17th gut state power to that regard, it weakened Article 5 as well because people aren't paying attention to their local races Agreed. anymore. And the most important, too. So I, I, I'll throw it to, you know, for one, I, 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 when I first heard him say that, I was like, what? Why would you want that? I mean, the initial idea was that better men would appoint senators. And that sounds pre- pretentious and elitist. And then you think about the math of it, the logic, and you're like, people need to be focused on their states. We, we hear it all the time from members of Congress. They're running for election. and They're like, in our town, crime is up X percent. When I get to Washington, I'm going to clean this town up. And it's like, no, you're not. You're going to the federal government <laughs> to vote on federal policy. Right. Our local elected representatives are going to fix that problem. But people lost that connection. So I, I, I would be for that. Um, I love the idea of a convention of states. My one fear, is it utopian? Like, you know, because I'll tell you this, you know what I'd love to see? I'd love to see a convention of states happens. The states are all predominantly conservative, which means there's a bunch of things I like, probably a lot of things I, I wouldn't agree with being more moderate, but uh, gun rights, for instance. I'd love to just see them be like, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to issue an amendment and says to reaffirm the Second Amendment, citizens of this country can keep and bear arms of any type or accessory or otherwise. There you go. We've spelled it out. And then just like stamp. But that's utopian, right? Is w- Would something like that really happen? My fear is you'll get, they'll go in and say, we're going to compromise on the Second Amendment and say, okay, we're going to restrict these things and make sure it's codified now. The, 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 here's the, the, one of the important things. Well, there's several important things. Number one is that the convention is being called pursuant to a resolution that has to be adopted, as you see on that map, by, by 34 states. And the resolution calling the convention is the governing document of the convention. And that resolution, and Mark can go through it because he knows it inside and out better than I do, but that resolution is a, re- is a resolution that says three types of amendments are eligible. All three types of amendments are limiting amendments, amendments that limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government or spending of the federal government. So an amendment offered at that convention that compromises as you say on the on on the second amendment and weakens the second amendment would thereby strengthen the federal right. government and would be out of order at the convention what if they argued that the constitution as a facet of government is being limited by taking out some of its protections the the application the resolutions themselves specifically say that they're intended to limit the scope the power and the jurisdiction of the federal government so if it's not taking power away from the federal government and returning to the people it would be what's called non-germane in legal terms. And and I want to address something much more practical than that. It's important that people understand. I hear that people are afraid of convention. Convention is a place to get together, have a debate, and make some suggestions. Now, I can tell you in my entire adult life, I've never had anybody say, hey, I'd like you to go to a meeting. We're going to sit around a table. We're going to make some suggestions. And my response was, oh, my God, that's so terrifying. Please don't have a discussion. Because what comes out of convention has to be ratified by 38 states. And I'd throw this out to your people who are watching the podcast right now that might be worried about this. I've said this to literally millions of people on the air. My personal email address, mmeckler at cosaction.com. If you're concerned about this, then just in layman's terms, send me the amendment you're worried about. And on the bottom of that, list the 38 states that'll ratify it. And the answer is, I've offered that to millions of people. I've not received an email because it's impossible. We're talking about the Second Amendment. Today, there are actually 24 states in which you can carry your handgun in the Capitol. I know I've done it in most of them. There are 14 states where you can take a loaded AR, sling it across your back, and sit in the gallery and watch the proceedings. It takes only 13 states to stop any amendment. Are you telling me we can't get 13 states to limit or to stop an amendment to, to do anything to the Second Amendment? It makes no sense. I'm 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 for convention of states for one simple reason. This ain't working. Exactly. Like we 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 think we're going to elect these people. Nancy Pelosi, she can't lose. 
She even said she held up a glass of water and said, you put a glass of water in my or AOC's district, you put a D on it, it it's going to get elected. That's true. Yeah, we, something's got to change. Something. The reality is that we know where America's headed, and it isn't a pretty place. We are seeing more and more centralization of power. We are seeing le- our freedoms being violated. We are seeing our culture uh, becoming more and more woke. And the reality is, and, and let's just, even the more, the biggest reality, we're $31 trillion in debt. I mean, just a few years ago, we were like six. And yeah. all of a sudden, we're like $30 trillion. And, and by the way, we're looking at 40, 50. At some point, this this house of cards falls apart. And we're sitting here saying, well, we'll trust Washington to fix that. Does anyone actually believe they will fix it? No, no one does. So what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of a group of, of legislators getting together and, and, and offering up proposals. Cause again, you read the constitutional language, the convention can propose amendments. That's it. Shall call a convention for proposing amendments. That's the quote from article five. So they don't ratify anything. They simply offer up suggestions that go to the States for ratification. And do I think we'll have dramatic changes at this convention or pr- proposals that will, uh, fundamentally change the constitution? Probably not. Because it's going to be really hard to get 38 states to ratify anything. But the fact that we would actually call a convention of states and have a national discussion. I mean, imagine, imagine if, you know, next week or next month, a convention was being called to by and having all 50 states send delegates to propose amendments to the Constitution. Everybody would be talking about it. It'd be amazing. It'd be on the it'd be on the front page of every paper for for months. We would have groups arguing and forming to propose amendments and get behind amendments. We'd have actually civics taught in our schools about what the Constitution is, what rights actually are federal rights, what rights are state rights, where are they better situated? Uh, how, at, at a time when we are so divided and so broken, having a national conversation about who we are and how we'd like to how we'd like to go forward as a country is really needed. What if you guys could propose like in your minds, the, the amendments that should be proposed? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think some of them are obvious that most people talk about One you hear all the time is some form of balanced budget amendment. And I would say that's got to be it's got to have spending caps and, and taxation caps tied to it. I mean, this, this is critical. The folks in Washington, D.C., they're never going to make the hard decisions. Why would they? They get punished for making those decisions. What? Oh, you want to stop? You want to cut off money to children and widows? And yeah. that's how it's always presented. So you put in a structure that forces them to make the hard decisions. I think that's a, a no brainer. Term limits for civil servants. So this is one of my favorites. And if you look at our resolution, this is really important. It does talk about term limits, but it says term limits for members of Congress and federal officials. And it's exactly because of what you said, because you don't want to empower the bureaucracy. You don't want to empower the staffers. If you're going to turn Congress, you better turn federal officials. And by the way, now we know of this as the deep state, right? That was conspiracy theory stuff a couple of years ago. But so you can turn out the deep state. When these people are in DC for 30 years, 35 years, they have the power and they have more power than the politicians and they're unaccountable and unelected. Yeah, I'll throw a couple at you. One, I think, actually could pass, and I know uh, there are people who might question that, which is to limit the Supreme Court to nine members. Uh, yep. And yep. You, you, certainly every Republican would vote for it, every Republican, but I look, there are some fringe people on the Democratic side who are for court packing, but the vast majority of Democrats out there across the country realize that if we start this game of the Democrats adding four and then the Republicans adding, it, it's a zoo, and and so, Putting that in the Constitution would be, if that's the only thing that comes out of the convention, that actually, and it would, there's no question that will come out of the convention. If that's the only thing that happens, that would actually be a good thing and a stabilizing thing, something we can all sort of agree on. Mm -hmm. And by the way, having something that we can all agree on that's a big deal is good for a country every now and then. We don't see it happen very much. The other thing I think too, the, the point you guys made about the 38 states is that these are conservative states. That are that are gearing up towards this. It's not like New York. Cal- 30, 31 of the of the fifty states right now. The legislatures are controlled by Republicans. That's going to go to at least thirty two or thirty three this year, and maybe more. And with Virginia, which is one uh, one house is controlled by Republicans, one is one short in uh, in in the uh, in the in the Senate. Uh, you could have thirty four states controlled by Republicans, and if that happens. 
We need 34 states to get to uh, to to a, a resolution passed to have this convention called. We could have this convention called on in a, in a year or two. But you'll need 38 to ratify. But again, I'm I'd love to see. Like I said, I'd love to see the court packing thing. And I'd love to see, for example, the federal government shall play no role in primary and secondary education. And you say, well, that have no chance of passing. I don't know if I'm Connecticut or California. I don't want Donald Trump or Rick Santorum coming into Washington, D.C., telling me how to run my schools any more than if I'm in Alabama. I want Joe Biden tell me how to run my schools. So you'd be surprised. Remember, these are state legislators, not congressmen and senators. You'd be surprised how many legislators would say, you know what? We don't want the federal government telling us what to do. So don't be surprised that there will be more things that could limit the power of the federal government that actually could be adopted, even when you need 38 yeah, states to do let it. Let me give you a real easy one that most people don't talk about. It's called a single subject amendment. A lot of states have this. And people are furious. You get these omnibus bills. They're 2,000 pages. That no one has read. No one, and no one could read them, yeah. to be realistic. And honestly, if you've ever tried, what you would find is there's so many references to other statutes and portions of the, you can't, nobody can can't understand them, right? Yeah. So a single subject amendment says one thing per bill. And the American people, if you ask them, it's 99% of the American people would say, yeah, absolutely. We can ratify that easily. Yeah. I wonder, how is it that we get this omnibus spending bill? It's like 5,000 pages. Who writes that? And why do, why do people vote on it? I mean, you've got experience there. Uh, well, every, every year the Congress is supposed to pass 13 uh, bills to spend, spend the money. And what happens is... Uh, that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of time on the floor of the house and senate and they don't want to spend all the time talking about those things so in the end they put it up all into one bill it's called an omnibus bill because they didn't pass all the 13 they may have passed two or three of them but and there's like random weird stuff thrown in these things it's it it look it is a process by which you have to get 218 votes in the house and 51 votes in the senate and or or more in some cases 60 votes in the senate so what do you do you horse trade and you say you want you know i don't want to vote for this well how about if i give you this okay i'll vote for it wow i mean that's the way things get done it's sort of i don't know if either of you are married but sometimes you gotta have to you know give and take a little bit if you're going to get things done and that's you know, that's how the process works we like to talk about guns as a really good example of how different people live different lives in different terrains right so if you live in the mountains for instance well we got bears out here you know, you certainly want to have some kind of protection for yourself. I don't know how you deal with an actual bear because you don't need a big gun. You're probably not carrying. <laughs> but uh, a, a raccoon or a fox. Right. Maybe uh, we've had raccoons out here and, you know, you, you don't want to be chased by one. Should it be ravenous right. or whatever, you know. Coyotes. Coyotes, for instance, yep. and the chickens. Uh, you live in New York City. I get it. You don't want a gun, you know, and then people are shooting each other. Fine. I think the Second Amendment you know, is for the entire country, including New York and the people who live there have Especially the right to defend themselves. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But the idea we often bring up is that the people in New York City who don't like guns vote for people in West Virginia, which makes no sense. I'll give you a better example is air conditioning. You got the people in the blue areas who are like, you know, we don't need air conditioning. It's a luxury. and It's bad for the climate. And the people in Miami are like, how dare you? <laughs> because they got you a, couldn't live in Miami. They got a statue of the guy who invented air conditioning down there. Texas just secedes. They're like, yeah, we're, like, right, right. we're out. We're out. We need it. We can't live without it. So, you know, that's, that's, that's not the same as a weapon. But that shows you that if you live in a cooler climate with less hot days, you're probably thinking to yourself, who needs this stuff? That's fine. Well, that's fine. If we're going to get rid of air conditioning in the south, we'll get rid of heat in the north. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, heat, it, you know, heat, but, heat burns as much energy as air conditioning, right? The, but it, the but same, it, same process. It sounds like that's the, the, the problem with compromise because... You're in, you're in, you know, office and someone says, I want to spend X amount of dollars in this place for this reason. You're like, well, that doesn't matter that much to me. Give me this and I'll do it. You, you basically start getting these weird policies that. That's why you have to take the jurisdiction away Absolutely. from the government. It's, you're never going to look any it, that's happened since the beginning of the Republic. They've always been horse trading that it has, it has to be that way. And, and you can make the argument that it actually reflects the needs of the different parts of the country because you horse trade for something that I want in Alabama that you need in New York. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. What's wrong is that they shouldn't have the jurisdiction to do 
it things that 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 are not within the federal government's purview. Yeah, the federal question is how much power do they have, exactly. right? I mean, that's a, if you what, take the power away, then you limit the amount of horse trading that goes on to the things that are more fundamental to the federal. And government. honestly, most people then government. wouldn't care about what goes on in Washington D.C., which is really how it was always intended to be. What you were supposed to care about were your local politics. What what was the local school board doing? What's your city council or township doing? Those were the things that were supposed to affect you as a citizen. The founders would be stunned that we allow so much stuff to happen in Washington. And the federal DC. government was supposed to care of make, you know, making sure that we were safe from foreign threats, that there was interstate commerce that could flow between the two, and that we had some trade policy to make sure that we you know, were able to trade goods, goods and services back and forth. And we've gone way beyond. And the answer is to pull it back. I want to talk about the other side of this. So uh, we were reading a story from a Business Insider. It's very critical of this convention of states where you basically have conservative leaning states are slowly getting closer and closer to calling an Article 5 convention. So just for those who missed the segment. But on the other side of this, you have the more liberal leaning states getting closer and closer to a, a, a national popular vote coalition, which would undermine the Electoral College. And in my opinion, literally just be telling the world like the moment that happens is, Hey, we want to do a civil war here is basically what you're saying if you do this. I think it's a terrible idea. A convention of states is like, well, they'll propose some some amendments. Maybe they can happen. But I mean, if you need 38 states to ratify anyway, that could happen through the Congress anyway, I'd imagine. A convention of states being called opens a conversation. Undermining the electoral college through states agreeing with each other just instantly ends the republic electoral process for the, for the president. It, it fundamentally changes how we elect a president and and makes the flyover states real flyover states. Mm -hmm. They become ignored because they uh, they don't have the they don't, that's not where the votes are. The presidential campaigns will be run in California, Texas, Florida, and New York. That's exactly. where that's where it will be decided. And it's, it's not just that, though. Um, and that's, by the way, every every president will be beholding to those big blue population centers because that's where the people live even in red states yes right. realize this yeah so uh west virginia for instance yeah when you go to the cities in west virginia they're still more liberal leaning and the, the surprising thing is to me you know in the second most trump supporting state you can go to a city and see the rainbow flags there's uh there are areas of virginia rural virginia as well when you're out in the farmland, when you're out in the rural areas and the houses are few and far between, what do you see? You see Trump signs everywhere. We got uh, one big sign over here. It's a gigantic sign. It says the swamp is 40 miles that way. It's hilarious. And then you, you, you go into a town of 20, 30,000 people, still the city, and you see the BLM flags. So what's going to happen then is you got a politician with only so much money. We go national popular vote. It's going to be even in West Virginia, the politicians are going to be saying things to pander to liberals. Because you got 20,000 votes, I can go here, do a rally, get all of them, or I can go to farms? Come on, that's too difficult. It's too far away. So this is just, I think this is the inversion of it, of, you know, what we see the convention of states. This is a move being, being made by the Democrat liberal leaning states, which I think- I To centralize power. Right. Yeah. You know, it, as Mark said, I mean, the, all you have to understand about the left, it's all about power. Everything they want to do, everything. It, the, the motive behind it is to accumulate power and centralize it into the elites who they believe best know how to run everything. So what do you do, man? I mean, if, if you've got half the country moving towards this, half the country moving towards a, a, a convention of states, you've got a pulling away in opposite directions. The culture is already fractured. People have already been talking about civil war long before I ever brought it up. I think the a convention of states is actually the antidote to the to the to a civil war. I think you're right. I think this country is increasingly divided, increasingly distrustful of the other side. Not just distrustful, you're about right hatred of the other side. They 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 believe that they have uh, bad motives and want to hurt them and harm them. That is that is a that is a, uh, a headed toward very ugly things. And what Mark has been able to do is take a lot of people who maybe feel that way, not maybe, they do feel that way, and channel them into something that the founders provided as the emergency escape clause. You know, the, and pro I, and the problem with national popular vote from a 
marketing perspective, you said like the easy thing sells, right? Yep. Take away your vote to vote for your senator. That sounds bad. You're not going to repeal the 17th Amendment. National popular vote, when you say to people, well, it's ridiculous. Somebody wins the popular vote for president and then they're not president. Uh, that's a pretty good marketing mm -hmm. tool, in my opinion. Much harder to counter to explain to people why that doesn't work. So I think it's a very dangerous movement. I agree with Rick. I agree with you. I think we are headed towards a civil war. I think the country is decoupling. Where I differ with a lot of people is I think it's awesome. And the reason I think it's awesome is because this is how our country has always been. We have some fantasy that we've been some unified country, like right before the American Revolution when the colonies hated each other and called each other blasphemers and were ready to go to, no, it was that way. After the revolution, we get together and, and we decide we're gonna form a government. We hate each other so much, we form the Articles of Confederation, gives the federal government no power because the colonies and then the states don't trust each other. We come out of that, there's a fantasy, we all love each other, yes. So much so in the 1860s, we have a civil war and we force a union. 80 years the, later. Right. Well, but I mean, after the civil war, we really like Yeah, exactly. Right? Everybody, that's when things were calm and peaceful. It's crazy. It's Not never. True. It's, Who was yeah. it uh, 1876? Was it the election was decided by a committee? Yes. And, and so, negotiation? And yeah. so we've never actually as a country liked each other very much. Except. And this, and this is what we, we forget. It, it was really after World War II. Correct. That's the only time if you look at America where there was a consensus and it's because we had just gone through two uh, uh, two world wars and a great depression yeah. and people were just tired of fighting and wanted to be at home with their family and raise children and not work i mean it was an idyllic time but it w everyone thinks oh that was america no no america was never like this was it a beautiful time it was a great time you can say a lot of great things about 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 the 50s and 60s but it didn't take long for us to say, well, you know, they, look, there's agitating against injustice. That's always been the American way. Absolutely. And by the way, in, in many cases, it's certainly in the case of the 60s and the civil rights movement, it was a great movement. We've always been a country that never just wanted to everybody get along we, because we're always agitating for something better. And unfortunately, the ideology behind what's better since the 1960s, since after the civil rights movement, has been destructive because it's been based on relativism, socialism, Marxism, and it, trying to bring that to this country. And now it's up to us to 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 fight back this culture war. And, and the founders gave us the opportunity to do it. It's about truth. Yeah. It is about so truth. Uh, critical race theory, for instance, you know, it's I, a lie. I, uh, it's it's well it's an ideology it, right and it's, it's and also it's, a lie it's twisted yeah. and uh you know i love when i get challenged by you know i'll be on facebook because i waste time on facebook periodically <laughs> i got multiple monitors and i'm reading the news and i had someone uh post about critical race theory and saying republicans you know they're crazy and they don't want you to you know learn history about racism or whatever and so i quoted uh, I, I posted saying or I, I, the meme was like it was a picture of the, of the of the people getting the milkshakes poured on them. And then I just said something like, you know, you using these people for your political ideology, blah, blah, blah. And then someone said, what is critical race theory to me? So I said, oh, you'd love to know. Let me tell you, because I do know. Critical race theory is a derivative of critical theory, Marxist yep, ideology. Yep. The idea that there are is an oppressor and oppressed class. Kimberly Crenshaw wrote in her book, because I read this, I, I read the chapter outlining the, the, the thesis, the basis, that Marx did not understand the, the racial tensions that exist in the United States. Therefore, the idea of, of uh, class oppression didn't work and you needed race, racial understanding, thus a critical race theory. And then I wanted to quote Derek Bell, who argued for segregation. He, I think he, he, he what is it? He, Plessy versus Ferguson was a separate but equal. He, he argued in f favor of it, saying the overturning of this in, in Brown, v, and, and Brown v, uh, v Board of Education were mistakes. And I'm like, don't come to me trying to use the civil rights movement to justify your ideology when your ideology is rooted in overturning the civil rights movement. But these people don't know that. They don't read these things. They never actually read where critical race theory comes from. They follow the, the lies from the corporate press. So we're not up against any, any you know, you're, it, there's the truth. The truth will set you free, but these people don't want to hear it. They're in tribes. They get their marching orders from whatever the TV tells them to do. And they claim that's not them. They claim it's the other side. And that's why it's important for you to speak. That's why it's important for all of us to go out and not be afraid. What What's happening in America until recently, and I, I give Donald Trump, Trump a lot of credit for this 
because he exposed the national media for the partisans that they were. And he did so by just, you know, punching them in the nose and getting them <laughs> ticked off enough that they dropped any pretense of being fair and, and, and wanting to be journalists. And they revealed who they really are. It, all of us have seen it. And we've, we look, I was in politics for, you know, been in politics for 40 years. And for 30 of those years, Republican politicians would stand up to the media on occasion, but it, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't call them out for who they were. We knew who they were. We understood who that 97% of the Washington press corps voted for Democrats, but we always tried to, you know, the idea was, well, you don't get into an argument with someone who prints, uh, you know, print you buy buys, zinc, ink, buys ink by the barrel. <laughs> and so that was the credo of the Republican conservative movement, which is don't fight against the media because they'll crush you. And for one who did and got crushed, I was used as an example. Look, you know, don't don't stand up and, and, and speak the truth because the, the left will crush you. Now they can't crush us as much anymore because of avenues like this and other avenues. And, and we have an obligation to use these avenues in spite of the limitations that Facebook and Twitter and YouTube put on those to continue to fight that battle and do it smartly. Well, you, you were on CNN for a short while. I was five years. Well, oh, so a little bit not, not a short while. Not a short while. Actually. In my life, not a short while. No. So, so what happened with? I mean, to 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 be critical of the media, <laughs> but to be in the machine. I mean, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put it this way. He's like, I Come don't know in. what I can talk about. No, I can talk. <laughs> no, I, I I can talk about it. Look, CNN was a uh, was an interesting. I loved working at CNN because I was generally speaking the only person in a, on a show or on a panel that had my point of view. And I knew that the vast majority of almost all of the CNN audience didn't agree with me. And so I, I saw an opportunity to talk to people about what conservatism was at, it, because they didn't hear it. And so, and, and so I, had, I, had, I felt like I had to be better than everybody else on the panel. And I, they could scream at me, but if I scream back at them, then I'm going to lose that audience out there because I'm what they portray me as. Yeah. So it made me be, my wife said, calmer <laughs> and, and more thoughtful. No, I didn't vary from the, I didn't back away from anything I believed, but I tried to make sure that I was communicating. It's not what you say, but it's what people hear. Right, right. And so I was trying to say it in a way that people, so for me, it was a great opportunity to, to, to make arguments to people and CNN when they put me on, gave me the opportunity to say whatever I want. So I have no complaints about it. I can complain that they didn't put me on the shows as much as I would have liked to have been, but that's, that's, that's the way it goes. Having said that, I got fired, canceled, because I made a comment that uh, the United States of America, well, I, was I was giving a speech to a group of young uh, conservatives uh, about the founding of a country, and I made the comment that we were blessed in this country to... Uh, have founding documents where we really didn't have a country before this country that unlike France, which had multiple governments and Kings and the history here in America, this was a brand new country. We started from a clean slate. And I said, the native Americans were, uh, you know, were here, but there was no country and that they had no, they had no impact on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the constitution and the culture. And that got me they fired. They canceled you. They canceled me. I saw a meme that's been going around and it's, uh, you know, you ever see the meme where it's like what women would do with a time machine, what men would do with a time machine? So there's a bunch of them where it's like, uh, one of my favorites is the, it's like what a woman would do with a time machine. And the, and the young woman says, I'm your, I'm your granddaughter. And the other young woman says, wow, from the future. Then it says what, what men would do. And there's one of my favorite is there's a guy with full tactical gear and he's got guns. And there's like a World War One soldier, and he says, "Grandfather, come with me. We're going to Jekyll Island. Trust me." This is the formation of the Fed. Yep. So there was one I saw where it's uh, they're handing guns to Native Americans, and they're saying, "Take these because they're coming and they'll destroy you and destroy your lands." And then all these you know leftists are like, "You're like, yeah, hooting and I'm, I just I respond to them. My question is, do you know anything about the Native American tribes and what it was like here? Because I'm not in any way justifying the the, the history of colonialism." But I think you need to point out, if you went to a Native American tribe and handed them, you know, M16s, they would just go and massacre their warring tribes. This idea that all the Native Americans were like unified and it's like, uh oh, the evil white settlers are coming to kill us. We'll stop them. It's just not, not, not the case. It would be like if you said if we went to Europe and gave them laser guns and fighter jets, it's like, yeah, they go to war and they kill each other. 
whenever you give weapons to, uh, you know, advanced weaponry to a, a, a society that doesn't have it, they will use it to empower themselves. But of course, that's called human nature. That is truth right. and reality. So when you talk about the history of the Americas, you had nomadic tribes, you had uh, some tribal governments. We did learn from and adopt some of their principles. It's really, it's really amazing history, uh, quite in fact. And then you look at like the Aztec Empire and the brutal human sacrifices and how they oppressed and enslaved local tribes. And it's like, it's not some utopian world. But these people believe in this woke psychotic narrative where it's just like whiteness literally from Europe or whatever they want to call it is bad and wrong. And that means anyone else is good. Where in human history have there not been warring people trying to control territory, different groups of people who have it, read the Bible. I mean, the, you, you look at the Hebrews and the, and the Philistines and the, and the Moabites and I mean, the, it's throughout the course of human history, there have been wars conquering for land and the idea that, that, that is somehow should should not have happened in this country that somehow that America is it, again it's a, it's it's not it's a for me it's a dystopian view of yeah. of of how the world and throughout history has worked well so you said a moment ago that you were uh, correct me if I'm wrong you were saying you think civil war what you were excited for it is, is that no I'm excited for the division and the reason okay. I'm excited for it is because okay, if you go back to the constitutional convention the men in that convention are screaming and yelling at each other. They're accusing each other of all kinds of horrible stuff. It's the North versus the South, big states versus small states. There are commercial interests that are fighting against each other in convention. We look back and we've got some weird fantasy that these all guys sat around, had a couple of pints of ale and came up with this beautiful document. The document is a result of that distrust, that dislike, that hatred. This is where federalism is born because it's a system designed for people who say, look, I don't really like you. I don't trust you. You're gonna infringe on my interests. So what we're gonna do is we know there's an existential threat. You've got England, you got Spain, France is actually an erstwhile ally. They're a threat. So we gotta band together for a few limited things. I still don't like you, but I'm gonna band together in a federal government with you. That's the solution for right now. Because the reality is, look, people in the South, if you're in Alabama, you don't really like people in New York, generally speaking. Yeah, you could travel to those places, you'll steer, still hear all the same regional prejudices. They have always existed, they always will. So this is a chance for us to say, well, how could we live together? Is there any way we can live together? And the answer is, yeah, the founders, the framers told us, have a federal system where I say, you know what, you can do what you wanna do. If I don't like it, I'm gonna go live in New York. I think the challenge is, I don't think, when we talk about the left and the right, the left having the, you know, the rule and not the exception, the right is the exception, not the rule. I don't know if there, there's an acceptable compromise. I mean, these are people who uh, cost, uh, ended up result, uh, committed property damage, rioting and, and, and murderous acts in 2020, and the politicians supported them outright. I mean, Kamala Harris was was funding their bail. Yep. 13 Joe Biden staffers, I believe it was 13, uh, contributed to the bail of these individuals who were committing these crimes. I mean, I don't know if there's a solution even through a convention of states, because I feel like even if you get the convention of states, you do limit the power of the federal government. These people still exist. They still have their their uh, tribal culture and, and, and bloodlust or whatever you want to call it. So I, I feel like a convention of states is good to address the problems of the federal government, but I feel like it would it would be a catalyst for a lot of these far left extremists and their cohorts in government who are going to lose power because of it. And then it just triggers conflict. It just well, ignites it. I would say two things. Number one, the most important reason for convention of states is to limit the power of fe the federal government to force cultural Marxism and 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 Marx and economic Marxism on the entire country. So if we can stop them from imposing, tried to, to, to in, generally increase the power of the federal government to the point where they can impose that on the rest of the country, which will cause, I believe, if, if it continues on, there will be conflict. There's no question there'll be conflict. Uh, the, uh, the alternative is a convention of states to propose amendments that will limit the power of the federal government or even just having the convention. Think about having the convention and the states rising up and saying, you know, we're going to check you. That in and of itself may limit some of what the federal government attempts to do or the left tries to do because they know now there's a viable option for the states to push back 
right? And it's, that it happened, nothing horrible happened, maybe a couple of amendments passed, but now that it's happened once, it's a lot easier to have again. The, 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 the idea that we're gonna eliminate the left and, and their grab for power, that's not gonna happen, but it's gonna be isolated in the states of California and others. And we'll see the destruction that is wrought in those states as we're seeing it now. And so what are, what's happening? People are leaving those states. I want to pull up this story from the Post Millennial. 60% of abortion clinics shut down in red states with pro-life laws after Roe was overturned. So for those that are just tuning in, we're, we've been talking a bit about the Convention of States. A couple things that I that I think are interesting here is for one, I definitely want to get into uh, your guys' thoughts on abortion. But I was, in, I was, I was thinking about this for one, this story actually uh, was a meme. It was a meme because people were saying if Planned, Par Planned Parenthood claims that most of the services they provide are unrelated to abortion, why would they shut down when Roe v. Wade was overturned? And uh, maybe there's some like political point they make. But the mainstream press came out and said, the corporate press, I shouldn't call it mainstream, said that uh, it's actually not true. They're not shutting down. It was just Planned Parenthood was like moving funds around. Well, now we see that a large portion actually did shut down when abortions became illegal. So I'm, I'm curious in this regard, one, obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, you, I want to discuss your thoughts on this stuff. But I was also thinking in terms of convention of states, would there, is it considered a limiting of the federal government to codify a restriction on abortion or the inverse, to codify the restriction on banning abortions, right? Because that's what the left has been arguing for. I suppose the, the argument from the left is the government was restricting its ability to ban this. The argument from the right is the government was giving itself the authority over it. You see how there's kind of like, both sides are arguing it's an overreach. Both sides would be arguing that their move is a limitation. I'm curious of your thoughts on, on that or it's, it's let's just say it's a it's a hard segue into the abortion topic. But, you know, yeah, I mean, I would say, generally speaking, if you were to give the federal government the power to regulate or allow abortion, I mean, this is essentially what Dobbs said. It's like this is not the federal government's business. This is a true federalist decision. It said the Constitution doesn't say anything about this. It belongs to the states. So I think that is the correct constitutional position. And I think any time, if, if under our convention you said we're going to give the federal government more power to ban abortions, I think you're now expanding federal power. Yeah, I think either, either way right. it goes, whether it's pro-life or pro-choice, it would be it would not be eligible under our, uh, our rubric. Because, and to be clear, like I just uh, I want to give my personal bias. I'm completely anti-abortion. Me too. So here I am, a, a guy from the right, anti-abortion, and I just don't think that that's in the Constitution for the federal government to deal with. And you know what? Uh, I agree. You know, um, I, I like the idea. The problem is, I should say the challenge is that you've got a side that's that's willing to have the Constitution be amended to enforce their idea. Absolutely. Whereas yeah. you are willing to compromise and say, we don't like abortion, but let the states decide. I've mentioned this quite a bit. This is this is conservatives compromising on the issue of pro-life versus pro-choice, whereas the left is arguing every state should have to allow it. The right saying, let some decide, let's say decide for themselves. So it's split. You're, you're, this, you're, this is a this is a real example of why a convention of the states having the discussion of convention of the states is is important to America, because I think as what I'm seeing polls go on and people realize that the Supreme Court decision in Dobbs didn't ban abortion, as the left said it did, uh, and that there, there, this is a decision that the people at the local level and state level can make. More and more people, even folks who are for uh, abortion being legal, are are saying, well, okay, I, I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with me having to say and what these decisions are. And that's really the argument we're making with Convention of the States is, look, let's just, re let's just, not just abortion, but a whole host of other issues that are really local issues. Education is a good example. Really, do we need the federal government telling us how parents should educate and, 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 and local schools should? No, let the community be able to make these decisions themselves. So we can get an amendment that says uh, no more uh, Department of Education. Yeah, we could. Absolutely. That'd be, that'd be Absolutely. Great. I mean, that's at the very top of my list. And Mine too. the majority of the American public agrees with that, not just on the right. There's plenty of people on the left that are like, hey, we want to educate our own kids our own way. If you live in Texas, which is where I'm from, right, and people think of it as a red state, well, I live just outside of Austin. That's about as blue as it gets. People in Austin want to decide how to educate their own kids. They don't want the federal government telling them how to do that.
Yes, I absolutely agree. I think, um, you know, to, to keep in line with this, one of the things we talk about every so often is that, uh, to put it rather, I guess, crudely, the left is removing themselves from the future of America through the sterilization of their children, through abortion. And so when you look at education, it's the one venue they have. Absolutely, I, I say this all the time, that the left, I, I wrote a book 15 years ago now called It Takes a Family. It was in response to Hillary Clinton's book, It Takes a Village. And one of the things I realized was everyone said, oh, it takes a village. It's an African proverb. And I said, no, it's a Marxist plan because the left, through their sterilization, abortion, they're not having children. People on the left are not having kids. So if they're going to win elections in the future, they have to corrupt your kids. Yep. And the way they do that is the village. And the village being... Why, why do you think they want to extend, expand daycare? Why do they think they want to expand preschool and kindergarten and send everybody to government schools for all these things? They want to separate you from your kids. Because they want to possible. separate yes. you from your kids. Exactly. They want to indoctrinate them into their point of view. And they are, and, and that's why do you think the teachers unions, the, the, the Roosevelt, when, when the issue, issue came up about unions for, uh, for federal workers, was 100% against it. And, and in fact, ultimately, and still the case today, federal unions cannot negotiate wages and benefits. Why? Because they knew that if, if, if you give the, the, uh, the rights of, of, of workers in a, in a government organization the right to, to organize, and you gave the power to the governor, the people in the government, to, 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 enhance, to reap benefits on them, then the teachers are going to, or the, or the federal employees are going to, shower money on these folks who make their decision and you're going to have corruption and you're going to have control by the union of the government exactly what's happened in the schools exactly where we are and and so the it is absolutely essential for us to um you know to fight this battle there was an um education weekly poll that came out just after the 2016 election that found that half of teachers had voted for hillary clinton but something like 29 30 percent had voted for donald trump i mean the occupation is completely partisan you aren't sending the same people and in part i would argue that the homeschool movement has such legs especially after the uh covid pandemic you know if you're interested in education especially in your own children's education in your conservative you're probably willing to try homeschooling whereas that's not true for especially women who have been told your career is everything if you have a kid you've got to get back to work as soon as possible otherwise you will lose your identity i mean the system is biased towards the flexible parents who are willing to stay involved in their kids lives yeah we we have seven children uh we homeschooled all of our kids uh through grade school it was the best thing my wife is a neonatal intensive care nurse she's a lawyer and uh, once we started having children, uh, she phased out of, of that work. And uh, she will tell you that it was the best investment she's ever made. She, we have amazing kids. We feel very, very blessed. And uh, I would just challenge anybody, uh, anybody who decided not to do that and, and went to the workplace, show me your portfolio of what you accomplished in the last 30 years versus what my wife accomplished in the last 30 years. And I would be, you'd be hard pressed to outdo what she did. This is, this is the craziest thing is that, um, particularly on the left, they don't understand the value of an investment in creating a human life. And it's a really sad prospect of uh, what their lives are going to be like when they're 70 or 80 years old. I, I, I gave a speech in Hungary at, at CPAC Hungary uh, a few weeks ago. My first thing I said was, uh, can any of you tell me the name of your great, great grandparents? Can you, can you tell no. me the name of your great, great grandparents? Great, 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 great grandparents. Mm. And the, the point was in a very short period of time, you're going to be lost. Your name, my you, great grandfather. I know. I'm, I'm talking right. about great, great. Yeah, okay. So the reality is in a hundred years or less, no one's going to know your name. You know, you will be, be gone. And, and, and the only thing you will create in your life that lasts forever and, and goes on is creating a human soul. I and, think, and, and, and those children then created other human yeah. souls. That's, that's your legacy. And so many people just are, have very misplaced priorities. There's this photo I saw. I can't remember exactly how they did it, but it was like a single grandmother and then her kids, her grandkids, and her great grandkids, and each of her, she had like five kids who each had like five kids who each had like five kids, and it's just insane yeah. 
how many the people. impact the impact yeah. and remember you you're having these children and you're raising them and nurturing them and you're preparing them to do the same to the next generation i mean you you put yourself into your children and you and and they can then take what you've given them and, and pour that into their children and their children i mean it's gotta you're keep talk, them out of those schools yeah the key and, and the point yes. is the left doesn't want you to do that they want to convince men and women not to educate their children not to fight for the souls of their children to give them to them and they will they will they will uh, rightly educate your children what you got to say to them is say if you have a kid they could become a child star and then you're rich yeah, yeah. or they can have a lot of followers on instagram and yeah. that will make you feel <laughs> immortal forever because as you know when you retire and you need assistance your instagram followers will come take care of you <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what they're known for I check think. it out there is going to be some influencer today. They're going to be childless. They're going to be 80. And they're going to be on Instagram, which no one uses anymore. It's going to be like only old people use. Everyone, everyone's on InstaTalker or something like that. And then on they're, WeChat. Yeah, on WeChat. <laughs> and they're going to be like, I use M Musiplex prunes. <laughs> you should get yours today. And then the, the several, several, they'll, they'll probably get $50,000 per read because of inflation, of course. And then they'll use that to pay. That'll buy them Musilex. Musilex. They'll, they'll just, yeah, I would just say, take a step back and recognize that this generation, last few generations who've been sold this bill of goods are the most unhappy, depressed generation, most medicated generation in the history of the country. And there is a reason for that because what you have been sold is a lie. Yeah. And you just need to get back to the truth and understand what really makes you happy. I mean, I really do hold social media accountable for a lot of this. I think it gives you a false sense of community. It's not that it can't be a great tool and it's not that it can't be very powerful, but you know, the, Robert Putnam who wrote Bowling Alone talks about this. It's just the complete degradation of community. If at the end of the day, you don't know your neighbors, yeah. you are not gonna be able to call your many, many Facebook followers to help you if you have a crisis with your kids in the middle of the night, or if you fall and you need help, you need to know the people that you live near. I mean, that's the only way to truly feel fulfilled in life. It's a scary prospect of what the future is going to look like for a lot of people on the left because they're going to vote for government to replace family. They've been doing that. That obviously. is what they're doing. Yes. But imagine what it's going to be like when these millennials are all older. They're going to be out in a massive voting block saying the government should provide for us a young person to change our diapers or something like that. Well, I think they're already saying that. And you know, when I travel around the country and I talk to young people and they look at people our age, they're like, hey, thanks a lot for the debt. Or what did we get for this? And and that's what we've done is we've spent their future. It's pretty outrageous when you yeah. think about it. We self-justify that. I say we because of my age, but our generation, we're leaving this incredibly massive debt. It means their taxes are going to go up. Their standard of living is going to go down. And if you ask somebody, hey, are you willing to do that to their kids? You would say, well, of course I'm not. That's outrageous. It's immoral. But that's precisely what we've been doing. And that's precisely what Democrats are selling to us today. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't want to say that it's, you know, you mentioned your age. I'm assuming you guys are both boomers. Is that your yep. boomers? Oh, the boomers. Um, <laughs> boomers and no, rhinos. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, we're boomers. bad, bad people. No, it's, it's, it's the corruption in government. Yeah. That, it's like the boomer generation for all this, the, 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 the flack they get from millennials for like gutting our future. It's like, yeah. Okay, okay I'm going to fight back on that. And well, the reason, and the reason I mean, I was going we to as well. Oh, okay. That, that's my point. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> my, my point was that you've got corrupt elites in government who are deficit spending and selling you a false, you know, bill of goods. And then to, to blame the regular working class American no, person is, is, is absurd. Now, the problem is the elitism that has been selling us out. It, before the boomers, there were other people in government. It wasn't the boomers who started the Federal Reserve. Okay, I, I'm going to fight back on this because those people get elected because they've convinced the American public that government can solve their problems and they believe it. Yeah. And so, you know, they're not getting, they're not doing it. These aren't people who came from outer space and are opposing this. These are people that you listening to this elected because they promised you something and you believed it. That's the problem. So I always say, you can point to Washington and say, oh, it's terrible, it's so divided. Well, now we're seeing, you know what? The country's pretty divided and they're just a reflection of that. And the same thing with this deficit spending. They're a reflection of a country that wants material goods and services and they don't want to pay for them. Yeah. How many times do you, I mean, how many things do you want? Oh, I don't want to pay that much. So let's just borrow the money. 
and that's what's going on. So uh, you can blame Washington, and I do, but that's why a grassroots movement like this that awakens America and has a discussion about what the consequences of what we're doing is such an important thing at this time. I wonder if it's just just a natural ebb and flow, right? You know, strong men make good times. Good times make weak men. Are you familiar? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And maybe there's maybe there's no real. It's just something that occurs when things get good. You don't have enough people who are calloused and, and hardened to what's going on. You're trying to wake up a ton of people to say support a convention of states. There's a there's a good argument about about it, but let the argument happen, I suppose. Why is the greatest generation the greatest generation? World War Two. Yeah, because, it was hard because it was hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people are made. I mean, I, everybody wants to avoid suffering, but suffering is part of life. It's whether you want to suffer for something that's great and worthy and last, or something that makes you feel good for the short period of time. I, I was saying this earlier today. That, uh, you know, people often say, like, maybe we're in hell. You, you've heard that, I imagine, from some people, like, maybe we're actually in hell. Look how awful things are. And I was like, maybe we're actually in heaven. Because, you know, this this world suits us so well. You know, it, it could just be that we've developed for the world around us or that we are made for the world. But my, my, I, the way I see it is suffering, we, there, there is no happiness without sadness. There is no light without right. dark. No. The, the, the universe is rather perfect in that. It's a great experience and I, you know, it's just about how you, 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 you choose to see it. I've gone through some really dark days, but I've always just chosen to be like, this is something that I'll remember. And I can always say I've experienced and learn from, I've had some really bad moments, you know, like standing out in a thunderstorm, shoes, getting soaking wet, car broke down and I'm laughing like heck of a story, man. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a something in life you get to say you've done, I suppose. And you rack all these things up and it just feels you know, whenever I whenever I would find myself in these really crazy moments, obviously not being having my life threatened. Like those obviously are truly horrifying. But I'm saying in like all the frustrations of a car dying in the middle of the road, having to get out in the rain. I'm like, those are things that are supposed to be bad. I actually think those are the, it's the spice of life, you know? Like you put you put habanero peppers in your food, it burns, but you like doing it. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, like that, that's where stoic, character comes from. Yeah, I was gonna say there are uh, enthusiastic uh, enthusiasts of Stoic philosophy who say like you should take a day and fast, and just so you know that you can get through it, you can be without food, you can suffer and recover, and it's supposed to be a reminder that you are always able to overcome challenges. You have to not be afraid to sort of tackle them. It'll work best though if government handles it all for you, right? I mean, well, this is I the would never do philosophy. anything without the government's <laughs> consent, as you know. Well, and so there's. Also, there's the the philosophy of the left is that man is perfectible, that you can make it through life with no suffering, and that's government's responsibility. It's flawed to the core. I mean, the reality is you've just described some of the best things that we experience in life come from our suffering. We become, if we make it through, we can become better people. We become stronger people. We become more empathetic people because if we experience difficult times that we see other people experiencing. Frankly, to be blunt, this is just how God designed us, in my opinion. You know, for, for my career getting started, I chose to go to places where my life was at risk. You know, like uh, going to the Ferguson riots, going to Baltimore, going to Ukraine, going to Venezuela. Venezuela is probably the scariest. I had to flee the country, actually. Hmm. And so, you know, a lot of people think like, you're crazy. Why would you take these risks? Why would you do it? And I'm like, for one, it's like a passion. It's a drive. You want to do it. But I don't want to downplay the, the experience of the people who have to live it, being somebody who just parachutes in. But the idea is like we pursue conflict not in the sense that we're trying to fight each other. Some people do, and there's some bad people, but that we're driven by overcoming challenges and overcoming conflict, embracing it head on. It gives us passion, it gives us purpose. The human desire is baked in for a quest to go out and chase something and do something good and great. And I think we repress that at our own risk, honestly. And I was one of the things, I, I think you were saying in the quote earlier about when with men with no chest, right? right? If we have a society that that builds weaklings, that builds in a uh, weak character, that we end up with what we have right now is, is really where we're at. And you know, and I wanna men say- Men can times make society. weak men. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I wanna tie this back to Convention of States, which is, and you're gonna have people, I'm sure there are people who are texting, it's too dangerous, it's too scary. And I would say, Thank God it wasn't you in 1776, Amen. really, because you would be the ones who are like, you know, it's pretty risky to go against England. This is the greatest empire in the face of the earth. And should we really take that risk? And I just say, hey, I'm glad it wasn't you. You guys ever watch The Patriot with Mel Gibson? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I always reference this movie. It's one of my favorite movies. 
Because what was, you know, his character, what was his name? Benjamin, I forgot his last name. I don't remember. He's saying, we can't go to war with, with he's like, if you're asking me if we should have, te- you know, uh, if we should be uh, no taxation without representation, of course. If you're asking me if that we've, we should be an independent nation, of course. But if you're asking me to declare war and to go to war with, with England, then I would say no. And then what happens is kids die. Right. So, you know, then he's forced into the fray. And um, the reality is sometimes you can't avoid the conflict and trying to just makes it come faster, harder, and worse. So I often like to reference the, the founding fathers. There's that famous uh, meme or writing about how they swore not only blood and treasure, but the lives of their families and their sacred honor. Mm. And, you know, uh, there was one founding, one of the founding fathers, signers of the declaration, his wife was kidnapped and used for a prisoner exchange. One had his son killed. So, uh, several of their homes were seized by the, by the, by the, by the British. And so that was them just straight up being like, let's do it, man. Screw them. Like, we're standing up for this. It wasn't as bad as these these memes make it out to be like all of the, these people. Like, no, no, a decent amount of them suffered and lost. They risked everything. And, and that's the reality of fighting for something good. But the reality, that was the elites of society. These were the, every founder was a was a person who was accomplished, who was wealthy, who had uh, was actually doing well under British reign. And yet yeah. they stood for principle. And I, just, you know, ask all of those who are out there saying, oh, well, we can't do this because even though it, 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 it's what the founders intended and even though, you know, we could uh, we could try to do something positive, I, you know, we're I don't want to risk that. And uh, the, the reality is that the risk is is much greater to allow Washington to continue to do to, to head on this inexorable course to control the future of our of our nation than to fight that battle and yeah you might it might be hard and you might not win but it's worth the fight well and i, I want to add in i think it's important for people to look around with open eyes and understand where they stand and one of the things we were talking about earlier is truth right and reality and just an acceptance of reality so if you're out there and you're thinking well this is way too risky and there could be a runaway convention that's the only argument we hear against it by the way then you should know who you're standing with and who you're standing with literally is George Soros common cause center on budget and policy priorities, La Raza, move on.org daily cause Hillary Clinton, all these people actually all these groups other than Hillary Clinton signed a press release saying the convention of states was horrible over 250 groups have signed this press release, every bad group on the American left, it's the baby killing Marxist communist America haters all on one side saying this is bad, you quoted the Business Insider article. This is the left rising up against us. And then you've got a few folks on the right that have bought into this. And I would ask people like, like if I woke up in the morning and somebody told me, hey, you're on the side of, of uh, La Raza and Planned Parenthood, et cetera, I'd think, hmm, I must be on the wrong side on this one. So if that's, if you've been set, sold this bill of goods, you need to step back and look in the mirror and see all these people standing next to you and ask yourself, well, is that really the side that I'm on? Let's go to Super Chats. If you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends, and head over to TimCast.com. Be a, become a member. We're going to have the Uncensored After Hours show coming up later tonight. We post those around 11 p.m. or so. Let's, uh, let's read some Super Chats. All right. There's some Super Chats. I'm not going to read that. Someone wants me to read a very <laughs> offensive Super Chat. But uh, I, will read, I, I will read some of the uh, Super Chats asking questions, some of them rather critical. So I hope you guys are ready. Yeah. All Love right. It. Let's see. Woot do for you. This one just goes right for it. All right. Santorum was the first political figure I learned about. He tried to outlaw fellatio and sodomy even between married couples. And the last also supported strict gun control in the 2000s. This isn't our guy. Were you, did you uh, support gun control? I don't know about the other one. I, no, I didn't. I've never supported gun I've gotten A ratings from every gun group that's known to, known to man. So, uh, no. I mean, that's first off just inaccurate that I supported gun control because I didn't. Uh, secondly... Uh, I stood uh, for a uh, a constitutional amendment to uh, put marriage in the Constitution as a as a union between a man and a woman. Uh, that was uh, that was an effort I tried back in two thousand four, but I never tried to outlaw uh, <laughs> sodomy or anything else. In fact, I made it very very clear that uh, just because something that I consider to be immoral uh, doesn't mean that it should be illegal or the government's role to to regulate that. Right on. Uh, so, uh, a Siri Designs asks uh, a question as if it was uh, present tense, but um, you, you're not in office. So, I would ask you right now: uh, If you were in office, they asked, "Would you vote to it?" They, they asked, "Will you vote to impeach Biden and advocate for hearings into Fauci and Pfizer?" My question is, 
when it comes to Biden and the Ukraine stuff, would you, have, if you were in office today? I guess, look, I'm concerned that we are headed in a in a time where we just, every president gets impeached if the other party controls the, the legislature. That is, that is a, again, that's not to say that the left won't continue to do it, but I'm not, I'm not a fan of criminalizing politics. Joe Biden has made, has been an awful president. He's made some horrible decisions if, uh, and, and uh, he should be taken out of office. To me, that's the way to get rid of people who are doing bad things, but to put the country through a routine impeachment of a president every, every two or four years, I condemn the left for doing it. I would condemn the right for doing it. If there is a legitimate reason uh, that there is a national, this is a threat that this president uh, is not able to do his duty and should be removed. That's the, to me, the principal reason he can't do his duty and be removed. That's one thing. Sounds like Biden. Maybe, uh, <laughs> but we well, have, but we have, the but 20th, we have elections. Yeah. That's what well, we have. We have elections. And, and that's why terms are only two years for Congress, four years for a president. And, and if, 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 uh, if he's done something, uh, again, uh, I, I think not, the nothing, is... nothing he's nothing he's done to date, uh, I would say, are impeachable offenses. They are horribly wrong and, and, and policies that have hurt America. But that 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 should not be the standard for impeachment. Well, so fair point in that. Well, uh, I, I believe the quid pro quo stuff with Ukraine was when he was sitting as vice president. Do you think that stuff shouldn't play a role into his presidency again? that the information is out there and the American public voted for him. And it, 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 we can't yeah, continue, we can't continue to go back and again, criminalize political behavior. There, there were legitimate reasons for Joe Biden to say what he said from a policy point of view. And you can say, well, there, there was that connection. Yes, but there was legitimate reasons from a policy point of view for him to say what he said. The Ukraine stuff. Yes, there yeah, was, I guess, I guess the issue is they impeached Trump for the exact thing, even though he didn't do it. I, I Again, I'm not the I left. Know, I know, right. Okay, exactly. I'm not going to adopt their power at, at any cost and destroy the democracy so I can control it. I think we have to stand up and, and, and be better than that. And you can say, well, if you don't play their game, you know, they're going to. No, if you play their game, then we lose everything. Man, it's tough. I hear you're saying. I absolutely do. I, I would say I come down a little bit in between, not necessarily for impeachment, but I think Republicans have to play much harder hardball. And I think Republicans have been way too soft. And, and when the power goes back and forth and we're just under constant assault and then the Republicans don't play some hardball in response, it encourages uh, okay, so, the assault. So here's, here's a, a point I would make, which is I, I agree we should play hardball. But for example, you have a president uh, who, uh, Donald Trump, when Donald Trump was in office, Donald Trump called for the end of the filibuster in the Senate. Right. Mm -hmm. We just lauded Joe Manson and Kristen Sinema right. for saving the republic <laughs> by by not Agreed. overthrowing the filibuster. But four years before Donald Trump and mo a lot of Republicans say, yeah, get rid of the filibuster. We can't be like them. I agree. OK, there, you. Yeah. You want to play tough, but don't take don't take out weapons. They're going to end up shooting you in the head. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And that's that, and that's what's being warned of Democrats right now, because. The, the what was it Harry Reid and the what was it oh yeah the, the getting Supreme. rid of the filibuster for judicial nominations yeah. gave us a, a court so be careful what you wish for there we are a rules based society and if we say we can ignore the rules and do what we want because we have power that's what the left wants to do that's not what we do well, what so, we so, do is we stand by the rules so the question uh, I suppose and we'll move on is just you know irrespective of any actual circumstances if if somebody did something that was either impeachable or illegal in a previous term joe biden as vice president do you think that should carry into an impeachment in the, into the presidency no 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 i mean that it's supposed to be for things done during the presidency right, right. and and right. the the american public by and large knew everything that he did i mean they, different different spins on things but the reality is let the public decide. That's, I do, I that's get, ultimately I, where we should I get go. what you're saying. And I think ultimately the problem is, is more so down to culture. Yes. In that we have a corrupt media apparatus that's yeah, not informing great. people. And that there are people who are willing to vote for this man, even if they did know. But let's let, we'll, we'll move on. All right. Let's see. Uh, OMG Puppy says the left doesn't want a convention of states. But if it happens, they will switch gears and take it over. Bye bye Second Amendment. 
I don't think that's that's possible. How? I mean, no, I, and that's what I would ask, actually, and I laid it out. How, how do you it's do it? literally impossible. A convention, all they do is make suggestions. It takes 38 states to ratify. Even if they could, they can't. There are currently 31 states, both houses controlled by Republicans. You, you're going to be at 33, 34 here in the next cycle or two. It's literally impossible. So when people say something like that, it's a weird kind of fever dream fantasy. And I hear it all the time. It drives me insane because I just want to say reality. Show me how that happens. And people say, well, I can't necessarily show you. I just believe that's going to happen. Well, that's called leftism, by the way. That reality is just what you dream it is. That You don't have to justify it. You don't have to demonstrate it. People who oppose convention of states, it's some weird fever dream that's been put in their heads. And by the way, it's important they know where it comes from. Literally, the idea of a runaway convention comes from Chief Justice Warren Burger. He's the Chief Justice who gave us Roe versus Wade. He was asked a question about the idea of a convention when states were starting to propose a convention to overturn Roe versus Wade. And he said, well, that's a terrible idea. We might lose our beloved constitution in a runaway convention. He was protecting Roe versus Wade. Yeah. I think people need to recognize that the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of this country is pro-gun. As much as, as much as the Democrats remember, keep claiming. At the time of the convention, if this happens, if 34 states pass a resolution to have a convention of states to propose amendments to limit the power of the federal government, that means 34 states will be controlled by Republicans. Why? Because if a state flips and is controlled by Democrats, they'll repeal the resolution that passed. So you'll never get to 34 unless you have 34 at the time of the convention. And so if you're saying that 34 states where Republicans are appointing the delegates to the convention are going to impose, I mean, I, call, I just got called a pro, a, an anti-gunner be, and, and, and for what? I've never voted against, I've never voted for gun control in my life, yet people are afraid. And, and we can't let fear govern us. Well, and I would add it, and to be even more blunt, stop being a tool of the left. If you're saying this stuff, you're a tool for the left and you can know better. You can go to Convention of States. All the arguments are there at conventionofstates.com, pro and con. Read them, decide for yourself. Stop saying the things that the left has put in your head. That's where it's coming well, from. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with people should do the research and check. Yes. Yeah, you should know that I was not a, up until a year and a half ago. I was not for Convention of States. So a year and a half. Why? What changed your mind? Uh, I actually read what it did. Because I was just told by, by some folks 10 years ago when this first came up, this is a terrible idea, runaway convention, don't get anywhere near it. And so I just said, okay, fine. Well, I was never, because this is a state issue, not a federal issue. So I just said, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan. I, you know, I'm worried about it, things like, until Mark finally said, you know, here, read about it. Look at, look, at, look at the actual research, look at the history, look at the court decisions. And there've been plenty of court decisions involved with state, with conventions of states. And it's the biggest no brainer. I mean, it, it, uh, you just, you sort of read yourself into the faith. Now I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm a zealot. I'm like a reform smoker when it comes to this. Do you get pushback for having changed your opinion? Uh, I get pushback, not because I've changed my opinion. I get pushback because people haven't read the information, don't know the truth and, and go by what some Supreme Court justice said 20 years ago. Let's read some more. We got a uh, super chat here from the Jenks. He says, hey, Tim, been thinking about becoming a member for a bit. Was wondering if you have ever planned to expand out any video game content since you have things like Pop Culture Crisis and Inverted World. We are currently in production on a video game. We've shown it several times. I don't think we've ever it's, said it. It's one of my favorite projects that we have going on right now. Video game. It's really fun. But you have to it's be super offensive. You have to be in the Tim Cast <laughs> lore. Like we preview it on, on the vlog or things like that. Like, yeah. You have to be in the know, so he should become a member. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, we're, we're, something we're doing in conjunction with Freedom Tunes. Seamus Coughlin uh, in the style of Freedom Tunes. Good, fun game. So we'll, we'll have more when we can have more, but there is a game in development. Maybe we should, you know, announce something about it or something like that. I don't know. Let's grab some more Super Chats. All right, we got a lot of people talking about uh, China. Wyatt Kaldenberg says, Tim, Google this. Chinese buyers snap up U.S. oil purchases at widest discounts ever. They are buying timber, land, metals, minerals, and every resource Wall Street will sell them. That doesn't sound good. No, and it's true. I mean, it's <laughs> absolutely land. going on. Farmland is another yeah. thing. Pieces of land near American military installations. The idea that we're even allowing this. And, you know, part of the reason we allow it is because people are cowed. Because if you say, well, we shouldn't allow the Chinese to purchase our land. Oh, well, now you're a racist. Now you're a xenophobe. And the Chinese love this. They're using this against us. Our good nature. I'm sure they our, plant that in for, they plant those, those well, memes. And they look at it saying, oh, we know exactly what their weakness is. We know exactly where to hit them. They're going to acute, they're going to, 
do anything Freedom. they can to avoid being called the R word. Right. Like, we just can't have this. Yep. All right. Let's see what we got here. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Uh-oh. Illuminati Confirm 69 says the Chinese elite are ethnic Han and China is the nation state of the Han. They pursue Chinese interests. Meanwhile, U.S. elite is foreign. China is at least a real country and not an economic zone. Now, what do you think of that? Do you agree? Well, first off, America, he is right in this respect, that America is not an ethnicity. It is a set of values and ideas. That's what makes us who we are. And that's why the left and the threat that they pose is such a great threat. When, they, when Barack Obama said he wants to transform America, that's what he was talking about, changing the values and principles that America was built upon. And, uh, and that's why this fight is so important. So he's right that America is not, it's not an economic zone, but it is a, it is a values and moral, uh, moral zone. And the, that's, that's why, unlike other countries, this battle for the soul of America is in fact real because we're not an ethnicity. We don't have a culture that's built on, a, on, on thousands of years of ethnic history. And wouldn't you say that like China benefits when we're more divided? I think of like the opioid crisis in fentanyl, which is illicitly produced in China, trafficked across the southern border and just further divides American middle class as well as cultural elites. We're at war with China. Yeah, and and excuse me, they're at war with us. We, we have not decided we're at war with them yet. All right, we got Ian Smith. He says, Nancy Pelosi, like, Pelosi likely in Taiwan to secure TSMC contract. TSMC, most valuable semiconductor fabricator worldwide, moving to Phoenix, Arizona. Semiconductor bill passed by U.S. last Friday. Have you heard that? Is that true? They're moving there? Well, they, they have a plant that they're building there. Yeah, yep. I'm aware of that. Yeah, there's a plant yeah. there. But uh, obviously, they just passed the semiconductor or they're potentially, I don't know if it's signed yet or whatever, but uh, that's that may be part of it. Uh, but again, I don't... They're yeah, and I, I think that's important, though, to point out, aside from the geopolitical consequences of what happens in Taiwan, that's where the chips are produced. Yeah. And the Chinese understand that if they get a stranglehold on Taiwan, they control all technology in the world. They literally can shut down virtually anything that way. Porkins, hold it, says, great to see Rick and Mark on Timcast. Trumplicans calling them rhinos. Chill the F out. Y'all came to the grand old party in 2016 and 2020. <laughs> We're individualist and different opinion and policy, not a hive mind like on the left. Man, I go. think that's so important. And so I'm, I haven't been involved in politics as long as Rick. I go back to, to 20, 2009, basically. One of the things that's always driven me crazy about the conservative movement, when we started the Tea Party movement, all kinds of people in the Tea Party movement thought, we're the first conservatives ever to walk the face of the earth. And they gave no uh, credence to, no respect to those who came before them. The conservative movement's been around for a long time. There are a lot of flavors inside of it. And I think we need to respect all of it. I was part of the Republican Revolution in 1994. Uh, people wow. don't even remember. They, they, the first they, time they got the Congress. The contract back. with America. Yep. I mean, we. Uh, I was part of a group called the Gang of Seven back in 1991 and 92. And, you know, we exposed corruption in the House Bank and we threw out the Speaker of the House. I mean, I, I was I was the original bomb thrower back in the day. And, you know, now I'm a rhino, right? And because and, <laughs> some guys, changing. like I said, some guy's been a conservative for 20 minutes. All right, let's uh, let's get this from Wagner Oliveira says, Tim, since you like the Freedom Caucus, I discovered recently that Ron DeSantis is one of the founding members of the caucus. Is that true? Ron DeSantis? Yeah, uh, that is true. And and I love Ron DeSantis. Like He's actually an endorser of the Convention of States project. He's actually one of the few politicians I've ever endorsed. I generally don't endorse politicians because they just betray you and crush your heart. Trump or DeSantis 2024? Uh, me, I would say DeSantis. What do you think? Well, for, number one, I endorsed Ron DeSantis when he first ran for Congress. I went down to Florida and did a, a did a rally for him, and he was in a competitive primary, and I endorsed him when he ran. And uh, I thought he was a strong candidate then, and I think he's a he's been as good a governor as I've ever seen in in my time in America. And he's to me he's the he's the right blend of having the right policy prescriptions. He is he is a MAGA, you know, nationalist, conservative, populist. I wrote a book back in 2014 called Blue Collar Conservative, which Donald Trump would even tell you is what uh, what he used as a as a template for uh, his his MAGA movement and did it better than I did when I ran in 12. Uh, and I think DeSantis believes the same same uh, same philosophy, uh, has the guts to stand up to the national media. He's shown that repeatedly oh, in yeah. Florida Fearless. and is not as abrasive or as radioactive as Donald Trump. Well, yeah. and I want to add a nuance to that, which is 
I, you know, if I were DeSantis or advising him and I don't, I don't know him, I don't talk to him. But what I would say is if you end up running against Trump, you don't go after Trump. He should say, look, Trump was a great president. I admire Donald Trump. Trump endorsed me when I ran for governor. We need eight years. We need eight years of a good, yeah, solid conservative president. But what if you got Trump DeSantis, then DeSantis, then DeSantis? I don't think it's realistic. That's not generally the way political cycles work. That's a that's a powerful, you know. It's hope. not though because the, the no, I, I mean like you, you're I get really hope. hoping like to get yeah. The three idea that you're going to get terms. three consecutive terms just generally doesn't happen. And I also think, especially because of how Trump is, it's just going to pump up the radioactivity in four years. It's going to make it much harder for ever whoever follows in and, his but, footsteps. But the re- you know, the Trump reality, wants to fire the, everybody. Yeah, oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah, but the reality is. Trump had it for him to lose, and he lost. Yeah. And the, you, you can say, well, they were after him. They did all these things. Yeah, but obviously he didn't handle them well because he had handled them well. It's not like the media didn't go after Republicans. I mean, go back. I, I always encourage people, if they're in California, go to the Reagan Library. There's a whole display there of the, how the media just beat the tar out of ronald reagan they they did they tried to destroy him and he was able to handle it and win and trump fought i agree but he didn't handle it and win and i want someone who can handle it and win all right let's see so um moan i think pronouncing that right says tim only goes hard on the left guests reason why you can't get any more left guests you need to gatekeep your people more hard than those you disagree with one of the things moan's been asking is that um arguing, what are your thoughts on Iraq having WMDs? Would you support war? Uh, and if and if there was war with China, how would you respond to it? I would support Israel doing what I think Israel will have to do and Saudi Arabia will have to do, which is take out Iran's nuclear capability at some point. Because Iran with a nuclear weapon is an existential straight threat to the state of Israel. I mean, they've been, they've been, you know, it's one of those things where you hear the leaders of a country say, we're going to eliminate you. We're going to make sure that, you know, Israel doesn't... And then you can't sit there as a small country like Israel and say, well, they didn't really mean it. <laughs> if they have a nuclear weapon that they can drop a bomb and do it, then then they'll probably drop a bomb and do it and they'll survive. Uh, Iran will survive it. And so, so you have to stop it from happening. Well, how do you do that? I, I, I suppose the issue is the Israelis can do it. I have no doubt about that. Would this not spiral out into a greater international? Not, not if not if the international community, as they should, stands behind them and says that they're uh, they're going to support their ability to uh, maintain to to maintain their own existence, and that's what this is about. Yeah, uh, going back to Iraq, Iraq was a mistake, absolutely, obviously a huge mistake. We flipped the balance of power in the Middle East in a way that's been very deleterious to just general world order. And I agree with Rick. I mean, I think the biggest problem in the Middle East right now is that we throttle Israel. And that we do our best to keep them from doing the things that they need to do for their own security. And I would argue for the security of the world and them destabilizing or taking out the mullahs or the the Iranians capability is a very. It's not just the Israelis. It's the Saudis. It's it's basically the Arab world. Remember, Iran is not an Arab country. It's a Persian country. It's a Sunni. It's a Sufi. uh, Excuse me. uh, 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 Well. I'm, I'm all of a sudden Shia country. It's a Shia Shia Muslim as opposed to Sunni Muslim. There, there are. It's not just Israel that wants that does not want Iran to have a nuclear weapon. It is is the entire most of the Middle East, and it will not be. I, su- I suspect it will not be just Israel that will will uh, in the end stop Iran from getting there. What are your views on entering into a conflict with China? My my attitude is, and I'll, and I'll tell you this too. My attitude on Ukraine, for instance, is I don't think we should be involved at all. I certainly understand the history of the region. I went over there and I met a lot of people talking about, you know, Ukraine's desires for entering the EU or, or, or potentially NATO that came up less. But I'm wondering, you know, thoughts on Ukraine, Russia conflict and then potential conflict with Taiwan. Should the U.S. be involved in either of those? So in regard to Ukraine, a little strangely, both sides of my family from Ukraine never felt any particular connection to Ukraine. If I got to draw the line, though, and uh, I don't, first of all, no boots on the ground, absolutely no American blood should be spilled over there. If I can use money as a proxy and we can be killing the Russian military on the ground without putting American lives at risk 
to some extent, I'm in favor of that. We're weakening a geopolitical foe. We're weakening a, a NATO foe by spending money, not by spending our lives with limitations. And, and part of it for me also is, are we actually there to win? Are we actually playing a game where we, we intend to let the Ukrainians or help the Ukrainians win? If we're not there to win, and this is one of my problems with conflict in general, man, when you go into a war, when you're fighting a conflict, the only reason to go into a conflict is to win. So what's the exit strategy? What's the end of this thing? I've not heard anything like that. And so I think what we've got is an interminable conflict that's draining the coffers of the United States. And I think that's bad in a general sense. In regard to China, from my perspective, and Rick said this a bunch of times, we are at war with China. We're in a conflict with China. Are we looking for a hot war? No, I, I mean, and I don't think that's modern history. The Cold War is really the model, but that was actually a war. We were actually at war with Russia in technological ways, in espionage ways. We're not treating China as that kind of a foe, and that needs to be our footing. All right, here's a, here's a hard one. Anarcho Booth says, classic Republican impotence. When the shoe drops and there's a power grab, they make concessions while the left rallies and mobilizes. Yeah, I'm not sure what concessions we're making. I'm not aware of any. What, what, what is he talking yeah, about? It's I mean, probably in reference to like impeaching Biden, for instance. So I, 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 I know you made your point on this. The view, I voted for the impeachment of Bill Clinton, by the way, just so you know. So. <laughs> but we're interested in Biden now. But I'll put it this way. For a lot of people who are probably not there's probably a lot of longtime, really staunch conservatives who saw Trump and they were like, to battle. And there's a lot of people that are probably more in a similar space to me. They were like neutral to liberal, moderate. And then we see the, the Democrats just trample over everything, take what they want while claiming it's the Republicans doing it. And then what happens with Trump is you have people begging someone to please just stand up and say no. And he did. Yeah, And so what people, yeah. and DeSantis does it too, DeSantis. I think DeSantis does it better in some ways. Yeah, You know, like uh, when he, he I, I can't remember, he was at a press conference and then, you know, the press asked him something and he just laughs at him and insults him. It was a while ago. I think the difference is though, he what he does is he destroys their underlying premise. He's actually using logic. So instead of just saying, you're fake news and I hate you and what, and DeSantis, I just saw his press secretary do this two days ago. Somebody was complaining from Politico saying DeSantis won't deal with any press that's opposed to him because he's scared of negative media. And he said, we're not scared of negative media. Everything you do is negative. It's just, <laughs> you're not relevant. We right. don't care what you think. And I actually think not caring is a better approach than simply doing combat with them. The reality is, and this is becoming more and more true every day because of people like you, the New York Times doesn't matter like they used to matter. Yeah, the problem, uh, going back to the, the question, the problem is you can't pick every fight. You can't fight every fight. I mean, if you're out there, and, and that's, what, that's what Trump wasn't able to do. He couldn't back down from everything was a fight. And he just, every single day was a fight. Every day. I mean, there wasn't a day that went by that he wasn't fighting about something that somebody said. And, and you need to pick your battles. And so... Going after a demented guy who's not going to run for re-election and spend two years getting going after a guy uh, in, in in an impeachment of Joe Biden when he's not going to run for re-election, he's going to be gone. Why are you wasting your time doing that? That's I fair. mean, you just don't, pick a battle that matters more to the American. So, government. generally speaking, so, the battle that I would pick is we need to go after all of these offenders inside these administrative agencies. We need to start investigating the agencies, gutting the agencies. I'd call no Fauci. No problem going after Tony Fauci. Right, I'd call <laughs> <him>. <laughs> Investigate no. the heck out of Fauci him. Fauci should be hauled before Congress. And and I think to, to be muscular, which is what the commenter is talking about, we ought to hamstring the entire federal government. That ought to be Congress's approach. If the Republicans take power, which I believe they're going to, they need to do everything they can to hamstring the operations of the administrative state. Let's grab uh, one more super chat here. We got Brian Lee who says, I love Rick Santorum. His book, It Takes a Family, was the first political book I ever bought and read. He's a sincere Christian and an honest man. I wanted Rick to become president. Oh, here you go. Well, are you going to announce all that? Are you going to announce your presidency Jeez, right now? Uh, thank you. I, I, I don't think he's related to me. So that's, no. that's really nice. Thank you. All right, everybody, if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, and share the show with your friends? We're going to be heading over to that members only, uncensored after hours show, which will go up about 11. You can follow the show at Timcast IRL. You can follow me at Timcast. 
Rick, do you want to shout anything out? Um, joint joint convention of states. I mean, just go go to go to that website and and learn about this. If you if you oppose it, I I I plead with you, do what I did. Go read the material, and if you still feel the same way, fine. But don't don't just take some meme that you saw that this is you know runaway convention or gun run. Read the facts, and then I, I think the vast majority of you do will will end up joining us. Yeah, two things I would say. Number one, pick a side. I mean, we're at war here in our own country for the country. And frankly, you're either with the Marxists and the leftists who are destroying the country and you're willing to accede to that or be a tool for that or fight with the patriots, the people who are standing. And you mentioned the movie, The Patriots. Stand up, fight, because they're coming for you. They're coming for your family. And then last, I want to say to the grassroots that are out there, I know of a lot of them are your fans. I've literally received more texts and emails about being on your show than anything I've ever done in 12 years of politics. Wow. I got a lot of advice, like you're going in to see Tim. This is like <laughs> going into the heart of it. It's so awesome. Uh, I would say to those people, God bless you guys. I mean, I love you. Rick and I get to travel the country. We meet Americans, have hope. There are great patriots out there all over the country. There, there are a lot of people who are like, you know, Tim, why aren't you challenging them on Iraq and all of these things? And I'm just like, for one, um, I think the important thing is if you guys have a difference of opinion on foreign policy, it's like there's only so much I can say when I'm like, I disagree. And then you say I disagree or like the Biden thing. What are we going to do? Just keep talking back and forth where you say no. And I say yes. And like, we're not getting anywhere when it comes to the people, the people we've had on from the left. It's like they'll say something factually incorrect. And then I'll be like, that's not true. That's not a real thing. Your opinion can be something on policy. I argue with Seamus about, you know, pro-life and pro-choice and stuff because I lean more towards traditional old school pro-choice. But so we can have an argument about policy positions. But if you have an opinion I don't agree with, I don't know what else I'm going to say to you guys. Right. It's like we disagree. Let's let's what else do you think? And look, I think you're good. You've been challenging us. You've been yeah. putting out the questions where people challenge us. Yeah. You even said people said he was a rhino and all these weird bills that he sponsored. So <laughs> to me to get I mean, how do you get well, much harder than that? Those are the fun ones. I right. mean, give you a chance to, you know. And I think those are important. I want to entertain those questions always. So but we need the good ones too, like yeah. people saying your book really helped them and things like that. We need to, you know. Uh, we'll move on. Hannah Claire, do you want to shout anything out? Yeah. Um, I'm a writer for TimCast.com, so I encourage you to go over there and click on the Read tab. I'm there five times a day. I'm also on Pop Culture Crisis tomorrow with Brett and Mary at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can follow me on Instagram at HannahClaire.B. I just want to say, if anyone has been um, following the stuff that's going on in Kentucky with the flooding, I really encourage all of you to take action and find ways to donate to those communities because it's pretty devastating. Right, absolutely. And uh, special thanks to Chris for running the show today while Lady's on vacation. Thanks for watching. All right. We're going to head over to TimCast.com. We'll see you all over there. And thanks for hanging out.